can continue. Um, let me see. Uh, can be donated equipment, uh, donated facilities, can be solicited, unsolicited, designated. An important word when, when you're getting donations sent into uh, your uh, nonprofit of choice. Uh, is it a designated resource or is it an undesignated resource? Designated, that's a hard word. Uh, when we talk about types of volunteers, certainly uh, a lot of you in the room have the wonderful affiliated volunteers with your respective organizations that, that are trained uh, or certified, depending on what type of training might be available. That can be a group of individuals from, from a, a nonprofit or a community based organization, could be an individual. We have our Red Cross partners in, in the audience and online today. Uh, perhaps they send an individual shelter manager to a partner agency to help with that location. So they're not sending shelter workers and all these other wonderful folks, they're sending a single resource. So it can be both. Uh, and then spontaneous volunteers, or some groups call them event based volunteers, but your spontaneous volunteers. Uh, not attached to any type of organization. Uh, they may be skilled or unskilled. We'll talk about how to figure that part out as we go forward. Uh, may or may not be uh, formed uh, from the affected area. And that's that's a really big thing to find out when people visit your disaster scene. Uh, if you open up a volunteer reception center, they just come in. They got there. They wanted to volunteer. They, they saw it on the news, previous slide, and they wanted to come in and help. Um, but now they're stuck because they have no means to get home. And that, that happens almost every time. Um, they may come as a group, group of church volunteers, group of um, uh, corporate volunteers. Again, not trained. No one knows they're coming. They just show up. Uh, so how, how do you work them into your disaster scene? Uh, the beauty of both groups are always wonderful, compassionate, and loving uh, people that want to give back and help. And then you always have to make sure, depending on the number of folks that are coming in, uh, how are you going to resource that? And this is um, some will come prepared, a lot don't come prepared. And a wonderful way to uh, plan for both of them is for your affiliated volunteers. They usually come to a Central Valley Point. You know that they may start off at a headquarters. You know at the events in the backyard. Um, they're usually plans for how they're going to be fed, where they're going to stay. All, all that's kind of worked out pre-event uh, as they come in. Um, and most of the, the VOAD type partner groups have a way to tra track their volunteers, uh, their hours, where they where have they been. That's critical for if, if you're looking to help, and I'm not going to get into this, but if, if you're looking to help offset the cost share in a presently declared event, uh, there is a cost share to the state. It's usually a 75% female pay uh, versus 25% that the state will pay. It can be no negotiated, uh, bits and pieces of that. Uh, but to help offset that cost to the state and also to the localities, that the counties, uh, there is a way for uh, volunteer and donated resources uh, to be captured and help offset that. So you're going to see this a few times throughout a couple of these slides, uh, but you're going to need a sign in sheet. You need the name of the volunteer, the day and the hours that they work, the location that they worked, and a brief description of what they did. We don't need a you know three paragraphs of what they did, just a quick overview. Uh, of what was uh, done. I also need a plan for the unaffiliated uh, and sponsored volunteers. What's going to be their entry point? Are you going to do a volunteer reception center or VRC? Are you going to do something else? You're going to have them come to your uh, your county, your, your location uh, there in the community. Are you going to have job assignments for them when they show up? How are you going to feed and shelter them? Uh, if they come in, uh, we have a lot of uh, wonderful recovery type groups that will come in for months upon time, and they'll work with local community partners and faith-based groups that, that for housing needs. Uh, but how do you plan for that and the response part of your event and recovery as well, but the response part for where you're going to house all these folks as they come in, if there's shelter that's needed. Uh, how are they going to be supervised and, and liability? I mean, that, that's a big one as, as we all worry about, but there are ways to, to help um, with that. And again, with the unaffiliated volunteers, how are you going to track the volunteer hours, what type of sign-in sheet uh, will you be using? Will you need the name, the hours? And there's been some really sophisticated uh, products out there. Uh, in addition to a sign-in sheet, there you can. There's um, uh, online type platform softwares that you can utilize to to call folks out, whether they're unaffiliated volunteers or part of your group. But uh, several of the groups in the room have a platform like that. But for when you're looking for a volunteer reception center. 
what type of platform are you going to use, um, if any? Now, most are paid type platforms, uh, but there's there's the great good old pen and paper when people come in. So how are you going to um, track folks as they come into the Voluntary Reception Center? Now, VRCs, there's training for that. So if, if you've never seen this before, good news is there's lots and lots of training for volunteer and donations management. Uh, 288 specifically for the uh, VRC training. Uh, which is utilized in, in, throughout the country. And I would offer that you see Lou's uh, afterwards about when the next training for 288 is. Uh, but it's a great opportunity to learn about how to set up a VRC. And it's it, this can be guts in a lot of reasons, but uh, you don't necessarily want it in the impacted area. Uh, if you can have it outside the impacted area, great. But if worst case scenario, you have to have it right then and there, so be it. But how are you going to get it set up? It's a great opportunity to register folks as they come in, get those waivers signed, um, identify the skills that folks come in. So they're going to have type of little mini interview as they come into the VRC to find out what their skill sets are. And, and almost all has some type of safety briefing. Uh, I think we've all been in some type of disaster environment. We know what it's like. Uh, the roads aren't clear. There's critters that can come and, and visit that aren't usually there. So it's important to have some type of safety uh, briefings uh, and equipment that can also be made available at the VRC. How are those spontaneous volunteers being fed? So there's a lot of wonderful mass care feeding partners in this room right now and most likely online. Uh, is there an opportunity to partner with with them to um, support that volunteer reception center with lunch or snacks or, in, or lunch and dinner, depending on the hours of operation for that? How are you going to market that VRC? Is it, is it a hotline? Uh, is the county going to set up something that that says, hey, if, you need, if you're going to come in, go here or call this number or go to this website especially for those spontaneous type volunteers it's a great opportunity as, as you capture them what's really neat about the vrcs is, is as they are connected with potentially a partner agency of a voad perhaps then that voad uh, organization now takes on 10 new people that are just fabulous they didn't know about before uh, it's now in the blood of they want to volunteer and go out on disasters and not sleep a lot it's a wonderful thing um and then the track hours, track hours, and track hours. We can't see that enough. Uh, there, there's been a lot of talk as of late about how to support the, the offset for the cost share for states. And, and really those in this room and online that, that have volunteers or um, touch volunteers uh, out on disaster scene, maybe that's not the right word. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to track those hours that have folks uh, come in, do good things and help that offset to the state, especially the counties. And when you get out to the rural counties, that offsetting of the cost share can be golden because the, the, there's usually the state has their cost share, the 25%, that trickles down. So how, as a community-based, faith-based groups, how do we help offset that cost uh, for those groups? Um, most of you are, are VOADs, but you know what? Uh, those that aren't the VOADs, the VOADs are coming. Whether they're invited or not, and that's a loose word, invited, they have a mission. And their mission is to serve. And so in a perfect world, uh, there is a really good relationship with that local emergency manager, the state emergency uh, operations center like what we're in today, uh, and they know that they're coming. But how do you plan for those? And a wonderful way to plan for those VOAs is there's a, a, a beautiful gentleman in the back room wearing a lovely blue shirt. For those of you that can't see, I won't turn the camera around, but uh, Phil Triplett is your state volunteer agency liaison here in the great state of North Carolina. Uh, a wonderful, wonderful man. He's not deploying anywhere out anytime soon. Correct, Phil? You're staying in, in North Carolina? There's a, <laughs> there's a tug of war between uh, North Carolina and California, but no. But uh, if you've not met Phil um, and, and would like to, I, I encourage that. Uh, he will be a wonderful asset to your organization as you go planning further with that. Phil works very closely with the Volunteer NC Group, Blues, uh, as we... Um, look at our disaster opportunities as we go forward. Two wonderful people to know, but in terms of volunteer agency coordination and liaison, uh, Mr. Triplett is your state val here in North Carolina. And myself and Christiana Bennett, who's also here, and I believe uh, Ari is also online. Uh, we are your, your FEMA vals for FEMA Region 4, but uh, here in North Carolina as well. So uh, when we get asked questions, it's usually, hey, Phil, did you hear about? Because uh, he has great uh, ears on the ground, wealth of experience, and uh, would would love to help you. 
Then as we get into donations management, um, my goodness, the, 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 I have to find the link, Luz, before the end of the day and it's in and out. There's a wonderful video. Uh, again, CBS News did a report uh, several years ago about uh, the, the, the disaster within the disaster. And this can really be a make or break. Uh, they're going to show up. Whether you want stuff or not, donations are going to show up and volunteers as well. But um, how are you going to store the donated materials when they come in? How are you going to distribute them when they come in? And now we're hearing from some wonderful folks later about some of this, so I won't sell any of their thunder. But just like with the volunteer hours and the tracking, as stuff comes in, document, document, document. Um, as you take in resources, what was donated, who donated it, and, and for what, and where is it going? Um, it's really hard when you break out a, a warehouse type operation where everything's coming in and there's there's opportunity perhaps uh, to, to inventory it and sort it and get it out to the partner groups or if it's a distribution site it's going to come in and it's going to go out just as fast as it came in so how do you track that it's very challenging to do at times but for a, a warehouse type uh, setting for storage and limited distribution and and these can this can be in the form of a uh, lack of a better word, so forgive me, Phil, a state type donations warehouse or a partner agency um, donated warehouse uh, that's supporting the operation. There, there's a couple of wonderful groups already in North Carolina that I'm sure you know of that, that do this regularly anyway. I believe we're hearing from one this afternoon. Um, but considerations for that warehouse, does it have a dock? Does it have a dock with a lift? Um, do you have a forklift for access to a forklift, pallet jacks, the saran wrap, everything that goes on with, with uh, warehouse distribution? And there's a class for it as well um, to look at. Now, space for sorting, repackaging, redistribution. Is there an office for you to, to be able to, to work out of? Um, the warehouse definitely should not be in the impacted area. It should be on the outskirts if at all possible. Um, you don't always have that luxury with the BRCs, but with the do donated warehouses, not distribution centers, but the warehouses should be uh, on the outskirts of a town, if you will. If you don't have access to a building, uh, certainly you can you can work out of a, a large paved lot or a, well, I'm going to stop there and just say paved lot because that, that would be preference. But how are you going to pay for that lot if it's damaged because you're going to have all this equipment coming in and out? Uh, the owner of that lot, I'm sure, is going to want to see a nice new repaved lot once you're done using that lot. It's not ideal. You're out in the elements, um, in, in the back of a trailer all day in the elements. It, it, it can be a bit much, but certainly if you want to, if you can find a facility. Great thing about lots is they're usually free. Yeah, you can use my lot, just you may have to repave it kind of thing. But the same would apply. How are you going to, how are you going to store the stuff? Um, you need forklifts, you need saran wraps, you need pallet jacks, you know, that type of stuff. And then again, we record and document uh, that process. So that was for a warehouse. For the co for the collection centers, uh, that's more of a, a you take in and it goes right back out type uh, items. Um, who's going to operate those for you? A lot of our faith-based groups do this on a regular basis and right after a disaster in their church parking lot. Uh, they have the volunteers and the space usually that, that can do this. But certainly as it gets too big, how do you manage that? And so working with with the, the state valves of, of the world and, and trying to find out are there additional spaces, you know, there, there might be multiple churches that are doing this. How do you help coordinate that in terms of who's doing what? The VOAD is certainly a great way to, to do a lot of that. Um, but when you have 30 plus churches that are doing that, plus the, the local corporation of whatever that's doing it, uh, you want to make sure that that, for lack of a better word, folks are competing for the, the same type of resources. And how do you share those resources? So the one group might have an overflow of, of diapers. Uh, the other group has no diapers. How, how do you connect those 30 plus groups to say, let's share the goods, if you will, because there is that opportunity. Uh, consider the structure for type of distribution. Are, are you going to do a, a, a drive in, drive out? Are you going to do mobile type distribution? A lot of our VOA type partners do a lot of that. Uh, and then re record and document. Um, Items will most definitely come in and they will most definitely go out uh, ra rather quickly. So your life, and, and th this is an easy picture, your life with, without donations management, you can certainly find a lot of other things online. Um, this is out in, in, in front of a, a, a store, if you will. If you've ever been to a shelter, go around back to a shelter. There's going to be lots of stuff. I don't encourage that. Don't, don't, I'm sorry, Red Cross. 
I don't mean that. But the the shelters is an obvious place. No, don't go driving around shelters in the canal suspicious. But um, stuff will come, and they they did it. They do a really nice job within the shelter to, to set up a spot for folks to come and shop, if you will, as they're transitioning out out of that shelter. But then certainly your life with donations management. Uh, you, know, you can see things are pallet jacked or, or palletized, excuse me. And there's saran wrap. There's there's wonderful shelving. You don't always get shelving, but when you get it, it's it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's an opportunity to work with um, your commercial realtors. Perhaps there's a facility, and, and these these owners can write this off. Uh, perhaps you use your facility for a month, three months, four months, five months. If it's a new facility or even an old facility, some don't mind you coming in and testing out the facility, making sure things are, are working or not working. It's an opportunity for that owner to also say, oh, yeah, we, we supported this disaster. This is what we did. In some ways, it's a, it's a good marketing scheme for them as well. But it's asking the right people. And and you may have to do 20 asks for one yes, but don't give up. No is not a bad thing. Uh, I am not on the public assistance side of a house, the RPA. I'm on the individual assistance side of the house. But we have guidance that says that there is a potential for uh, supporting that cost share, offsetting that cost share. Again, it's document, document, document. But there's also an opportunity for private nonprofits to potentially receive some type of reimbursement for emergency protective measures. And there's there's a lot that goes along with that. So if you want to learn more about that, we can we can talk at a, at a break or at a later time. But point being, um, there is guidance, and it's it's an open source guidance. Our public assistance and individual assistance uh, guidance is all online. Uh, so certainly, if you want to learn more about PA, I would ask that you start with your state PA person because they they are really and truly the go-to uh, for this type of stuff and really all things PA. Um, we get to work with y'all. It's not the other way around, and we we are invited to come support. Uh, and when we come in to support, it's not that, hey, we're here, we're, we're, we're taking over. It's no, hey, Phil, what do you need? Where do you want me to go? And, and it's the same um, with, with Volunteer NC. What can we support? So if you want to learn more about PA and, and that process, um, please do, do see your state PA person. And Phil, my apologies, I don't know who your state PA person is. Um, if we can get that at, at the break and maybe send that out in the notes, if there's a follow-up lose, that would be great for folks to have as well and then but as you're looking for the help with the offset um information needed once again for the volunteer hours is a sign-in sheet name of the volunteer volunteers days and hours work the location and the description of, of, of work and it's not just a response where the volunteers and donations come and play uh, we talk an awful lot in the VOAD world about long-term recovery uh, and can be a few months, 18 months, two years, uh, most of the time it's a lot longer than that. So those type resources, cash, donated type resources, stuff is still going to be needed in long-term recovery. It, it doesn't stop once the response phase is over. And so we do try to continue it with, with uh, you know, cash is best. I mean, ca cash is, is, is kind of key <clears throat> when you talk about um, money for coming in or resources coming in. It allows that local partner group to get exactly what is needed, not what is wanted. We have to differentiate when we get into the disaster world of response to recovery, wants versus needs. And cash allows us to get exactly what is needed. And we have a lot of wonderful VOA groups that, that can quickly do that with the right amount of resources, primarily being cash. Uh, it helps rebuild the local community. It helps volunteer agencies meet the pre precise type needs, supports long-term recovery. If you've ever uh, done, if you've never done long-term recovery, cash is definitely needed for a variety of reasons, uh, and and it's needed often, and, and in big numbers. So if there's any funders in the room or online, um, funding is welcomed. We we have here um, in the room we have our North Carolina VOAD uh, Disaster Case Management Committee lead. I'm sure she would love to see some money as well come in, um, but. Uh, cash is king. It's cheaper to send as well. You don't have to do all this, open up the warehouse. We're going to go out in a lot. Uh, it can be, be brought in right into a, a, a nonprofit. Uh, or if there's some type of state fund set up, certainly that's an opportunity as well. A donation drive is much more work because there's a cost involved. We have a lot of groups that want to send and sister groups, and, and they're great. 
But they want to send the, the, the three tractor trailers of stuff that was co collected, you know, three states over. And they want to bring it tomorrow. You're not ready tomorrow. So how about if you bring it a week from now, two weeks from now? Expectations management will be key in any type of volunteer donations management. Um, and that's a great lead in to public messaging. So you want to make sure if the locals are asking for something, the state should be asking for the same thing and vice versa. If you as a, a volunteer organization is in need of, uh, of X, make sure you're asking for the right kind of X. If you're stuck with a microphone in your face and hey, what is needed, be careful what you say of what is needed because it's going to show up. I need, oh, it'd be great to have some dog food. Guess what's coming tomorrow? A tractor trailer of, of Chow Wow, whatever the brand's called, is going to show up. Um, we have a, a lot of uh, groups that will be out, mention something just casually. And then things are going to show up. Be careful uh, on how you're messaging. But if you are going to message out, what's the message of the partners of the county of the state? So that you're all doing a universal type message. So there's no confusion about why well, I, I didn't ask for that kind of a thing. And regular messaging. So you can't just make the one big push at the beginning and never make another ask. You're going to need stuff in a disaster environment, both in response and recovery. So make sure that you have uh, and can messaging is great. You could go ahead and put something together. Now the state has a wonderful PIO office. Most of the partner ag agencies have some type of PIO public information officer that already has can messaging ready to go. How do you guys talk now uh, ahead of an event um, about what's going to be put out uh, for needs with coming out? You know automatically you're going to need X, Y and Z. So how do you have that can message ready to, to push out? And, and uh, forgive me losing Phil for not knowing, but that does North Carolina still use needs list? Is that still available? We are. Yes, we're still using it. And we have another organization that's going to be doing donations, uh, warehousing, um, <clears throat> management uh, training later on this afternoon. And they're going to talk about needs list. Great. So for those on the line, uh, there's more coming on needs list this afternoon. So uh, it's a wonderful tool that, that can be also be utilized for uh, donations as well and for what's needed. Uh, again, being very specific and we're, how are you going to get that message out for folks to get back to you? You're going to establish some type of hotline. A lot of counties will stand up something immediately after a response call here for all types of information. But uh, is that going to stay true for the locality? Is the state going to push some type of a number or a website such as the needs list or something else in, in terms of uh, donations management? So even if you're specific, um, as I said, excuse me, uh, things will show up. And, and I have to put this this here because I, I like Elmo. But um, we had uh, in Sandy Hook in Connecticut, we had the unfortunate um, disaster there. And uh, we had somewhere in Connecticut still resides a warehouse full of teddy bears. There was a tremendous outpouring and wonderful outpouring of support for that community and for the state. Uh, for the kids that were impacted by that event and the families, but you can only do so much with teddy bears. Uh, and there was an outpouring, disaster within disaster, of stuffed animals uh, there. Um, able to utilize a lot of it, but there was just so much um, to use for that. But but even though you say no, it's still going to come. So how do you plan for that? And, and throughout the rest of the day, you're going to hear different ways to be able to do that. There's some um, spontaneous volunteers are going to show up. There are some other mechanisms for additional affiliated volunteers, both on the state level and the national level, that can also come and support uh, your events, uh, your group that you're going to hear about more from this afternoon. Uh, in terms of training opportunities, uh, there are quite a bit. And we have coming up uh, the Mercy Management Institute in, in Maryland. Uh, there's a class coming up this August. Um, I believe. It's still active uh, registration. It may be full, worst case scenario, apply if you're interested. Uh, it's paid for. Um, you just have to, to sign up there. Uh, I believe is a, a prerequisite, which might be the IS 26. The IS is Independent Study 26. The IS classes, you can go online to FEMA.gov uh, or you can actually just type in FEMA IS classes and, and there's a thousand of them that you could take. But the ones as they relate to volunteer donations management, uh, I would encourage you to look at uh, IS26 guide for points of distribution. 
uh, really good about warehousing and how to set up a pod, if you will, not a points of dispensing, but a points of distribution. Um, and then IS244, Developing and Managing Volunteers, is a good class. And now these are, you know, a couple of hours. They're, they're not super long classes. Uh, and then the 288 is the role of volunteer agencies, volunteer organizations, emergency management, not to be confused with the G288. That's the in-person class that you're going to go to, learn about the VRC, you're actually going to role play. It's kind of a cool class uh, to take, but uh, I, would, I would get with your, your state group to find out when the next um, local volunteer donations management class 288 is. But if you want to try to get into the um, 289, at EMI, again, those are the dates for the class. There are three more offerings of that next year. Um, we do see some of our classes slow once we get more into hurricane season for all the obvious reasons, uh, but the no hurricanes this year, right? So not somewhere, but um, trading opportunities that, that are available. And again, check with your, with Luz and Phil about any other opportunities that might be coming. And some of the VOAG groups offer some wonderful trainings as well as it relates to volunteer and donations management. So. Uh, this is what's available for uh, the state and with, and with FEMA. But, um, I went quickly, lose, because um, we wanted to do a, a three-hour lunch today. So we wanted to make sure we had enough time for, for questions. And, and uh, let me get back to... We have one question in the chat. Um, is there a standard applicable cost associated with donated commodities for cost-share purposes? For cost share, is there a course for cost share? Per, not, not really. No, there, there is um, guidance within the public assistance that we call it the Papa G, the Public Assistance Policy Program Guide. Um, it's being revised. We should have a, a revised Papa G early next year, springtime, and there'll be a section solely on um, private nonprofits, but also about the the cost share. Uh, cost share information is already in there, as is the PMP, but we're looking to make it more of its own uh, specific uh, section. Okay. Um, what is that going on in the chat? Oh, um, we have Julia Carter at Long Term Recovery Alliance, Hill Pass, <clears throat> cases of 128 families to bring back to safe homes post Florence. We need funding. So. There it is. There's your ask. <laughs> um, so I mentioned Phil Triplett's in the room. Uh, great resource. Uh, no, let me see it. I didn't see the first part of, of that. My goodness. Yep. Well, and, and, and there are some potential funding opportunities, corporations. Uh, it's, it's finding out if, if your long term recovery group has a finance committee um, or subcommittee. It's a great opportunity to connect with them. Um, most of our counties have United Ways. How do you connect or if there's a community foundation? Uh, there's a lot of funding opportunities. They dry up sometimes because, you know, depending on how long the event was, uh, those opportunities get, come and go. But, you know, how do we reinvigorate um, those funding opportunities, especially for the families uh, that may, might need those resources? But, yeah, that's a tough one. It's funding, especially with, with long term recovery, because it's there's no time frame for long term recovery. Your long term recovery is when everyone gets back to the whatever their new normal is going to be. So. Feel free to uh, unmute if you have um, additional questions for Chris. Ooh. Hopefully they can hear me. And I'll caveat that to say I, I don't hear so well. And so uh, if if, uh, if you are going to ask, I'm going to see if I can't turn this up some. Oh, it's already up. All right. Those if I just okay then. But yes, sir. Just one other. So Daniel Alton, I'm the director of communications and disaster services for Catholic Charities and Diocese of Raleigh. Um, going back to the comment you made about cash is king. Just one advertisement for National Boad on the National Boad website, and I sent the link to lose. There's a great video. Uh, I know messaging around give us cash to donors can be a challenging ask and challenging message. And, a delicate message to share. And so they've got a great video uh, that's 90 seconds um, that explains why cash is that uh, great donation. A lot of what you just explained. Um, so just for talking points and as a reference point, uh, that's on the National Vote website and just something that uh, agencies can tap into uh, for messaging as well. Is that the you told them? I think it's the ad cancel. I think Tap might have gotten involved with it. 
Um, but it's donate responsibly is I think the name on it on YouTube and it just puts it into good context. So just a resource to keep in mind for everyone in the room and on the call. Okay, we'll get that one. Yeah, please have it. Great. Okay. Any questions <clears throat> from our virtual participants? Okay, we have one here. Are there any um, online um, <laughs> courses with FEMA on either long term management or emergency planning? Are any of them online? Well, the, the, the 288 will touch on it a little bit uh, in terms of uh, uh, funding distribution. Um, but then there's um, Rebecca, I don't want to speak for the Red Cross. We all have a volunteer management class. We have a number of classes, but none of them are specifically volunteer management. There are some that help you with managing volunteers, but there's not like an overarching overview to volunteer management training. I think that the, the state 288 is a wonderful starter class. Um, and then in a perfect world, you would be the, the, the state class, and then you look at the, the 289. There's actually 289, 49 that, that was up there that sometimes goes together. The week long time class that will touch on, on both of that. Uh, and, and we'll get to some of the, the, the nitty gritty of it. The state 288 class, G288, I should say, uh, allows you to role play that process for the volunteer. It's fun. It's fun. Well, hey, it's fun. Hey, <laughs> right Actually, FEMA brought in several of these classes during Hurricane Matthew that they did not do that I was hoping they would in parts that maybe in the next event because there were three or four that they actually brought in and did with volunteer and donations, spontaneous volunteers. And mm -hmm. So that's when my toes got wet getting into yeah. it. But those exercises, we drove the uh, FEMA instructors a little bit nuts, but it was fun yeah. and we learned a lot. Okay. Anybody else has any other questions? No? Okay, well, thank you, Chris. Let's give him a round of applause for that great presentation. You finished early, so we're going to have a couple of minutes, uh, let's say five minute break. Um, and then we're going to have Persia with BEOC uh, do her presentation. And we'll be back. <laughs>
I have a question for um, for our virtual audience. Are you able to hear when the speaker is not in the podium? Can you hear the conversations happening in the room? Sounds faint to me, Luz. Sounds vague. OK, OK. Uh, the next presenter wanted that feedback, so I will let her know. Thank you. Thanks. We will start in one more minute. All right, thank you everyone. We're going to um, start the second presentation and we have Persia uh, Jackson, right? Persia Payne. Oh, Payne Hurley. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I tend to forget names, but, um, but I could be marrying a different guy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and she is going to be speaking about business EOC and um, just want to make sure everything is good. Yes, Persia, ready when you are. <laughs> Right. Hey, thanks, Luz. Um, Luz said, you know, she's trying to marry me off to somebody else, and I hope he's, uh, I hope he's handsome guy. You know, uh, but my name is Persia Payne Hurley, and uh, I'm the newly minted um, assistant director of what is North Carolina Emergency Management's newest section, the Office of Partnership Engagement. Uh, we are about three months old. I would say, uh, and um, a, a, a very, uh, you know, high, high tech, high end kid, but still in diapers. Um, so the Office of Partnership Engagement, I thought I'd tell you all just a quick little bit about it before. But before I get into it, I want to thank each and every one of you for what you do for North Carolina citizens. Y'all are kind of like, you know, tip of the spear, you know, out in the battle. And as a retired army person, I can appreciate that being out there in the trenches and y'all are. So I appreciate that very much. And so does everyone that is out there in North Carolina. They don't know they need you yet, but when they do, you're there. So thank you for that. Um, Office of Partnership Engagement. So new section, but uh, housing some elements that y'all are all familiar with. The CERT, the Community Emergency Response Team. Um, I know you guys have heard of that. That's led by uh, Samantha Royster. Uh, our Val, which somebody mentioned before, and I think he ran out of here, probably for fear that I would call on him, Phil Triplett. Um, he is housed in this section. And then the uh, Business Emergency Operations Center, which is now coordinated by a great guy named James Wong. I don't know if any of you guys have met him in the last couple incidents we've had. Um, 
I was able to, I was honored to start the Business EOC in 2014, and it's been a, a, a very cool experience. Um, and what Director Ray thought was by taking these three elements, the CERT, the VAL, and the BEOC, that we could do a number of things with those three groups that um, deal with outreach and partnership. So we wanted to take it beyond maintaining, expanding, enhancing partnerships and see what we could do about coordinating those three groups, going further and building some resiliency, getting innovative and really press pressing the envelope, um, which I enjoy doing. So that was the purpose for creating this group. So you guys give us a little time. We've, we're sketching up our strategy, but we are ready to operate this season, which is the good news. So I wanted to make sure that you were aware that that happened. Uh, and um, we hope that over the next couple of weeks, um, we can get into the real solid mission for you of what all this is going to mean, but uh, that'll have to come later. So let's see if I can make this thing advance. Well, it's advancing over here, but not over there. I don't know if you have no idea. No idea. Usually it works. See, advancing there, but not there. Yeah. Let's see. So I'm going to um, get into a discussion of uh, a brief that I typically do called uh, creating a disaster resilient state. Um, I'm not going to go into big details because you guys are so familiar with what we do um, that I want to focus on more the private sector donations management, which is what the BEOC gets into. And um, to give you an idea of where this idea came from, um, this idea of a business mercy operations center. And this one is. This oh, one thank you. You're welcome. Well, I don't know if you can. Can you click? We're having an IT work. There you, you go. You did it. Thank hey. you. <laughs> She's magical. <laughs> thank you. So um, those are the three offices we were just talking about, our three groups. So this creative and disaster resilient state, I'm not going to get into details with it with you guys because y'all know pretty much what the business EOC does. I think you do. Is there anybody that doesn't understand or not dealt with the Business Emergency Operations Center, BEOC, that I coordinated like the last uh, nine years? There are some people online who are representing different organizations that have, I'm not too familiar. Too familiar? With well, this is a, this is an information sharing and operational hub for the private sector. Uh, started in 2014, I'll tell you all that I think originally they weren't really sure what they wanted to have happen other than to get into a conversation with private sector. Um, but um, thankfully, we had some good ideas and kind of innovated on a few theories that had been out there since Hurricane Katrina. And that is uh, some of the lessons learned from Louisiana and expanded into what is now a pretty unique program and the first operational business EOC in the nation. So what does it all mean? Well, this particular group of private sector folks are not just um, a distribution list or just an email roster, but there are people that actually come and physically come into the state EOC in a response. They are connected virtually with us because they have access to WebEOC and they train with us. And this has become a, uh, a process that's happened every single year. So they're part of the statewide exercise. They're part of an annual business TTX uh, that we do every year. They're part of our WebEOC exercises. And in my view, at the time, you know, you can call it PTSD from, uh, you know, commanding drill ser sergeants and counting too many sleeping bags and canteens. I never wanted to warehouse anything after that experience. I never, ever wanted to count a spoon and a jacket and boots ever again. So to look at private sector donations, which they were very excited to donate at the level that we were sharing information. Um, I thought the last thing I want to do is count a thing. And so I began to train them and um, I'm skipping around you guys because I don't want to bore you with, you know, what we do in, in, in terms of emergency management, but specifically on the, I mean, bore you because you already know specifically on donations. Um, but what we tried, what I wanted to do was create a system where private sector would hang on to the offers for donation 
and then allow North Carolina emergency management to take those things on the draw. So they were offers until we accept them, <coughs> then we don't count them and I'm not watching them and I'm not distributing them either. So also at that same teaching, you offer it, you donate it, you transport it. So the way we are organized right now, our partners make offers. We take those on a draw from various locations, stores, warehouses, and if they offer that, then they transport it and they ship it directly to the need. So we called it speed to the need because I like catchy phrases like speed to the need. So we're not touching it. We're not redistributing it. We're not doing any of that. The partner has control over the process when it's in route, when it's on scene and coordinating with you or you or you. Now you get to meet them. They show up, they do deliveries. Now you've got a direct contact with them. So. In my brain, I thought it would work in Hurricane Matthew, it did, and I'll show you that in a minute. But my point that I wanna to make to you is this is a rapid um, request, offer, coordination in the BEOC and deployment of assets for the private sector. That's what it's become, rather than a warehouse somewhere that is going to um, potentially slow the process or um, get us into a situation where I am pulling you and you and you away from other help that you could be giving survivors when the private sector can just ship direct. Does that, does that make sense? I'm getting excited because I've had like three cups of coffee and I, I get pumped <laughs> like this. So, um, but that's in, in, the, in a nutshell, that's what we've done. So I can show you the proof of that, but I think that uh, a little background, because I'm backtracking a bit. Right now, the program is about uh, 1,300 corporate and business partners. And that cross about 11 sectors of business and industry. So these are not just big box. These are not just um, uh, large retail or folks that do home improvement, but it's med farm, it's tech, it's comms, it's telecom. And it's even odd, I don't want to call them odd, interesting partners that you wouldn't expect, like the North Carolina Association for Long-Term Care. You know, they had previously been partners to, um, they previously, I'm going to stop that for a second and just calm down. You know, the, the caffeine is racing. They had previously been partners of public um, public health, but approached me. I'm just kind of giving you an example of what happens. Approached me saying, hey, we're a business too. And um, they sit in the BEOC, which is located, uh, guys, down and through on the other side of the building, Caddy Carter from the governor's office. They come every single disaster, every single activation, they send somebody from North Carolina long-term care. And what kind of things you're gonna say, what are they doing in there? Well, obviously they're gathering information. They're also informing us on what the, you know, some of those vulnerable people, people in our communities need. And we have our hand on the pulse of things that could potentially go wrong. You guys have seen the stories in Florida and other places where folks have tried to evacuate uh, our elders and it's not gone well or they've not evacuated them and it's not gone well. So just understanding that. And as a result, um, we have had our hand <laughs> on a big evacuation, Hurricane Florence, where our one of our long-term care partners evacuated like 555 seniors uh, and they didn't lose a one. But because they were here, we were able to track the progress, listen to the reports about how many ambulances they were going to need, how many they're taking from the community, coordinating that with law enforcement, how many they didn't need to leave for regular rescue, and just watching that so it was done orderly. And, and, it, and it turned out to be such a great experience for us um, it, as, you know, when you got past the stress of it, that everybody was okay. Because the proof of, uh, of that is something I learned, and that is when elders get taken out of the place where they're comfortable, they start to take a turn within like 48 hours if they're not back home. And so, and that's why people typically don't want to evacuate them at all. They say it's better to leave them. And then if you can't get to them later, it's a worse situation. So you can imagine how that became a great partnership for us. And in the meantime, those guys offered uh, to survivors stuff like um, uh, uh, adult incontinent supplies in bulk. Stuff you kind of need sometimes. So it's been a great exchange. And I'm using that as an example, but I'm gonna skip forward to just tell y'all how we did this. So after, and this was the question I was trying to answer, how we create a more disaster resilient state when I got into this. 
and I'm going to pass our vision because I've kind of told you guys what that is. OK. And I want to go right to BEOC. So this was the mission of the BEOC and it remains. We wanted businesses to resume operations or continue operations as quickly as possible following a disaster. Why? Because if they are supporting communities, right, then communities can stand up on their own. That was the idea. We weren't asking for donations. We weren't asking for any of that. The point was how we resume normal operations, get back to normal. But because of our partnership with so many folks and our willingness to bring them in here and have face-to-face -face interaction with North Carolina Emergency Management, as well as access to WebEOC, that's when donations started to really pile in in terms of people offering. And that's when I started to panic about the warehouses. I told y'all the PTSD and you know the, the whole uh, canteen cups and, and, and that thing from the drill sergeants. So we, and, and I, I can define this, but the bottom line, I've told you that, and these were objectives. We're gonna provide them situation awareness, information sharing. The more they learned, the more they exercised with us, the more interested they were. So what happens when we put operational? And this is the BEOC, it's down the hall, and y'all can walk down there and take a look because it's open right now. Um, what happened when we went operational? Well, in a nutshell, um, we needed a way for private sector to immediately get requests from you or you or you or any state agency. So giving them access to WebEOC was key to that. Why? Well, makes sense, right? Because then they have eyes on, it's a common operating picture. When they're able to see what's happening, when they are able to see what you're posting and you're posting and counties are posting and the other agencies, they get a sense of how serious the situation is and what the needs may be. And that's when they started to offer, they offer just, you know, you know, just different, different things in quantity and in form. <laughs> so my request to the director that I could handle strictly private sector donations, you guys, I'm not talking about community donations or faith based or any of that. These are just strictly from businesses because of the bulk they could bring and their willingness to transport to themselves, taking the load off of you and us to do that. So um, a couple of things that I am going to say, and I'll talk about the process, but I will say it was necessary to coach them on what we might need. So looking back at past requests from past hurricanes and past floods and whatever, I tried to devise a list of what we saw most often. And y'all can imagine what that is, water and tarps and diapers and baby food and that kind of thing. But also things that we knew, I knew, that the state logistics teams would not keep in a warehouse. Stuff that we would need right now. Also, any kind of odd do hickey, what's it, um, you know, strange trinket. I'm going to call it a trinket, but it really isn't if you're looking for mosquito dunks, right? But something odd that we would not handle in the logistics in a warehouse here. Um, and I would give them those lists. And what I wanted to do in preparation, and I think we were successful, was uh, we started doing something that uh, I'll call virtual warehousing. So the BEOC Assets Board is what we call it. This is a place where the private sector can park their offers for donations. We can see it, we can see quantities, we can see locations. We can map, map that with Latin longitude. We have a point of contact for the company and where it is. Could be over three locations of stores, could be in one warehouse somewhere, but we also have the name of the person who would be responsible for transporting that. Now, that's just sitting there. And I like that because then before, in a hurricane situation, before it actually hits, not only does the director have a mapped outline idea of where all the state assets are, he knows where the private sector assets are as well common operating picture, right? So those things are ready before landfall. So, but these capabilities, and you see I have assets board right there, deployable assets, force packages. Um, let me explain. It's not just donations in those deployable assets and force packages. I'm mentioning it because you would have access to those as North Carolina lawyer groups. And that is deployable assets would also include things the private sector has on loan. Because I give them a choice. You can offer something for donation, but you can offer it at cost. You can offer it at a discount, or you can offer it on loan. We probably get, gosh, Phil's not in here. I don't even know what the average would be of items offered on loan. 
stuff like tele telecom offering goats and cows and portable whatever's what's it to keep our tele our, our communications up that's an example they would deploy it to help in a situation and then come pick it up so it's on loan a cell on wheels a goat um we have had things like during the pandemic we had 14 reefers and we weren't high right refrigerator trailers that our partners donated to the various uh, food banks. Now, now this is interesting, right, you guys? They donated the refrigerator trailer. We know how much they cost. They offered them, transported them, fueled them, set them up and maintained them. And we had 14 of them for nine months supporting food banks and, 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 and in conjunction with the National Guard that was helping with feeding. They saved a lot of food and a lot of time and they were on loan. And when it was over or when they were done, they picked them up, transported them back. No, no, no cost to us or the food bank. I'm just giving you that example. So that's an on loan example. Um, <clears throat> resource requests. Since I told you guys that they were set up through WBOC, it means if Catholic Charities was doing a mass feeding or I'll call it a mass barbecue because I'm hungry right now. If they were doing that and they had and they uh, had been feeding and they had an idea of the burn, how much water they needed or whatever. They could then say, we're going to be out by Thursday. Um, we're going to need 300,000 units of bottled water. They could put in a resource request through the county EM coordinator, for instance, that, hey, we need 300,000 units of water for the barbecue that we're having, you know, at whatever location. That guy could put that into WebEOC, or if you had access to WebEOC, you could put it in, and that resource request would come in like it normally does, go through logistics. Logistics would see that, and they would probably think, Catholic Charities needs this Thursday. We're not going to be able to get it out of the warehouse in XX location by Thursday. Let's shoot it to the BEOC, in which case my folks would get that, and somebody from the BEOC would grab onto that request, and we'd assign it to them. And then they would have it right in WebEOC when it was in route, uh, in progress, on scene, and delivered. And they would be talking directly to you, and it would be historical rec record in WebEOC of your request and what you were doing and why, so that we could verify that. And the private sector person uh, would supply it and transport it and drop it and shake hands with you. And they get a gold star, and they get to say, we helped. And let's take our picture with Catholic Charities. You see what I mean? And they go away. No cost to you, no cost to the state, no cost to the county. That's an example of how it works on resource requests through WBOC. Is this making sense? Yes. Maybe I should just stop. stop. I know I can go 100 miles per hour. <laughs> so any of you have any questions? Let me pause, catch my breath. Anyone have any questions or is this just like, I'm just trying to gauge how I'm doing. We have some of our smaller partners that might be on the call um, and would want to put in a resource request or might be new to the process. What would be your recommendation for the best way to have those resource requests come in in an organized way um, and kind of that communication level for groups that have any needs? Well, I don't know what they're doing so far. Can you reinstate the question uh, so that- Oh, I'm sorry. The, uh, the, okay. the okay. question was, how do the smaller partners or organizations on the phone, how would they put in a research request during an event um, if they needed something? I think the best and what my recommendation would be, um, I mean, I would certainly ask how they're doing it now because I'm not sure how that works. Three months, you know, baby and diapers, we're very excited. I'm not sure exactly how that process works currently, and I wouldn't want to change policy and, and make everything uh, confusing from folks that are already operating that way. But I would say that if that group has got that need uh, that they can verify, meaning they can show these two people have this need. And my my thought is that if they contacted the EM County coordinator, and somebody stopped me if I'm, I'm, I'm going sideways, and said, we have this need, these people are over here, or we're doing X, Y, Z. I don't see why someone at the county wouldn't submit that to WebEOC for a group that did not have WebEOC access. Now they could also contact where are our, one of these two people in the middle here, Thomas, 
our human services gurus, human services gurus right here that would be in this breakout room over here. And I know some of you guys would be here during events, sitting in breakout room in human services, and they would have knowledge then because it could come through you of what that need is. And human services would probably call down to the BEOC and say, hey, do y'all, do you, are you, how quickly would you guys be able to get X? Or is there somebody already that's offered you Y? Or do you have on your BEOC assets board, I don't know, a, a fixed wing aircraft, which we had offered on the assets board once. Does that help out answer? Yes, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Well, what's the relationship between LTRGs and the BEOC? Yeah, I don't I don't know right now what that is since we're kind of newborn, but I, I mean, I'm talking about the Office of Partnership Engagement since I'm now leading that. But I would say that, um, um, and see, he ran out the door, so now I'm going to put him on the spot. <laughs> Phil and I have talked about the expansion of his role. I'm calling it the expansion of his role. Um, whether he's going along with that or not is unclear, um, but I think that working with the long-term recovery groups um, is going to be, in my view, a heavy duty, blue sky, heavy activity. Uh, there's a lot of gray sky things that Phil does, but I'm looking at it as a very heavy blue sky activity because there's so much, I think, room there for innovation and creativity. And so I think that in a, a few months, you might ask me the question again, and I could tell you a, a different version of my dream, but I will share with this group now, 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 you know, don't call me tomorrow, but I will share with you that I envision a time when uh, mo more private companies will be partnered with VOADs, with the North Carolina VOADs and other organizations and even faith-based, if it's their choice. I envision a time when I can be, you know, although the BEOC has been a great connect in gray skies, I think that in blue skies, a more long-term, more established relationship can happen. And I have heard of companies that partner specifically with volunteer uh, organizations for particular projects that have nothing to do maybe with, um, you know, this particular disaster or that one, but it could be a community based project. So I, I, I you know, dream a little dream kind of thing. Um, I, I would suggest to you that, you know, that that may be that may be a long time coming, but I think that some of the connections through gray skies may open the door to the longer term blue skies established relationships. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, well, you know, I've heard about needs lists. Oh, sorry. The question was, how would this work in light of needs list? Um, and I guess you mean in conjunction with that. I, I know I've heard of needs list. Fascinating. Sounds great. Um, I think I need to be in the next discussion about getting a discount on needs list because I'm, I'm pretty persuasive, but necessary, a great tool. And it's not, I, I don't, this is not to interfere with needs list. This is, if you need us, we're out there. This is who can get it fastest tomorrow in four hours. So look, I, I think I, I think what might help is I give you a little example of the speed of these guys can can carry. Now and and let me qualify this. The biggest challenge to me with the BEOC, at least the way it stands right now, among partners, among businesses, is many of them have the same policy of we do all this stuff during disasters when there's an actual declaration of state of emergency. The minute that expires, we, we, we can't go any further. A lot of them have that kind of policy. Now, it and, and part of that has to do with their philanthropic arm or their CEOs, but I find this policy over and over. Walmart is a good example. Walmart will come out of everywhere to help you while the disaster is in the response phase. But they have policies, and I get it, and it's their company, that once they transition to recovery, they really can't give at the level that they can in response. So my personal goal had been, okay, so everything that I get that's offered on the assets board or that people commit to during response, I am now just massaging the idea of, you know, you got these 53 commercial grade dehumidifiers on the BUC assets board, which we have. 
can I convince you to leave those on for at least three months after the disaster is over, after the response phase is over, so that we can, you know, get the full use of your offer? Or I'm in, I'm looking at a number of communities. We already know who's impacted, and all the damage assessments aren't in, so all the requests aren't in. You know, what I mean, that's the direction I'm going with that because. We don't have the assessment. Like if I start saying, hey, I want to leave those three, they're going to, the company's going to say, well, we're in recovery now. Um, we we know the idea of the impact of counties, but we don't have many families. You know what I mean? I can't connect their offer to an actual group of families or community. I can say it's Robeson County, but I can't tell them it's 25 homes, it's 30 homes. And, we, and usually we don't know, you know, four days after landfall. We are still in the assessment phase. So I'll say to you, it's a great question. We are working on how much faster can we do assessments? And, and we started a UAV group among the private sector. That's the uh, drone group, the ones that are flying. How can we faster get an idea of assessments so that we can better connect resources to the need? So it's it's kind of in progress, but that's been a big challenge for me. Now, do all companies act that way? No, but majority I'm finding the ones with the deepest pockets typically do it that way. And I think Luz is signaling me. Am I already oh, no, out no, of time? No, 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 no. I just wanted to add something with uh, the question that um, Anne asked. We uh, we plan to activate needs list during disasters, and we have people who are administrators that are going to be here at the EOC looking at what's happening and also managing needs list. We had previous conversations before with uh, Greg and Persia in which we discussed the manage, you know, the, the inclusion of the platform, but um, we need to find a process um, to be able to manage those activities that are going to be going into needs list. So that is in conversations at this moment uh, with logistics. So it's it's we haven't been able to find that that process or develop that process yet but needs list is going to be active and administrators are going to be here at the eoc trying to manage both i think you guys i see the connection with needs list this way if there's a bunch of needs out there <laughs> that have not yet been coordinated with a a source that especially on the ones that have been there for a little while, that somebody might push that to the BEOC and then let us cast it out to our partners and say, hey guys, we have got um, we have got the Salvation Army saying that they need X. Is anybody in a position to support them? And just now that might mean that Salvation Army, for instance, needs to put in a resource request to human services. Because see what the companies are doing is they're not asking for anything back, but we like to give them the option of taking that as a tax credit if they like. Some of them don't, but if they put it through WebEOC, I've set it up so that they can put the value of whatever they're giving there. If they'd like to take it, uh, and then of course we thank them with a letter from the governor. You asked the question. Is there a virtual resource guide, like just overall? Oh. The question is, was there a virtual resource guide? I think what she's asking is, we're, are we doing online shopping? Is it, we're not doing online shopping. I, I don't, oh, sorry. Maybe that's not what she was asking. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I mean, like all of the, uh, the private sector partners, a list, basically just a guide of all of the partners that are on the table and everything they provide and the time frames in which they're willing to provide. Yeah, that would be really, really cool, wouldn't it? Um, I'll, I'll tell you guys this. I think that part of the key to our success is I have, you know, I keep in mind that these are free private entities that can do whatever they want. If they want to, if they want to be involved in this particular event, they will. If they don't want to be involved in this one, but maybe the next one they will. They, folks can put um, five refrigerator uh, trailers on our BEOC assets list for this particular disaster and then drop them and put 10 pallets of water the next I mean they can they can offer whatever they want I mean they are free folks they can do whatever they want or they can sit out this one and they're waiting on a big one I've got folks like that that say well I'm not going to do this this one sounds small we're not going to be involved in this I said how do you know it's small I just feel that might be small but but then they'll say but but Persia if you need us call us fair enough 
I, I like I like the blank the blank check. I like the if you need me, call me. Because I have made some strange requests. And and what kind of strange requests? I mean, when I asked for mosquito dunks, I didn't even know what they were. I just knew that the mosquitoes were so big, they were carrying away small children and dogs. And I needed mosquito dunks because the guys out east said, hey, we're, you're getting killed by mosquitoes. And, and, and when I put that out, I put it out as far and wide as I could. So I don't know if I'm answering your question. I mean, it would be wonderful if it was all packaged and organized and perfect. Just like we give them a list and say, these are the things that North Carolinians and organizations have asked for in the last three hurricanes. We know what we generally need. We ask for that. Some of them come back with that. Some of them come back and say, we don't have that, but this is what we have. Example, Cree, what it used to be Cree, and I had to call them Wolf's, Wolf Speed out in RTP. They're an RTP company. When I heard of them, I said, Cree, who is Cree? They're not Wolf Speed. I don't know who they are. I met them. They called me, boy, person, we want to be involved in this. We think this is great. We want to help. We want to help. And I'm thinking, Cree, who are they? Well, they're the people that make the squiggly light bulbs that last forever and could withstand a nuclear blast. You guys know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. So I said, great. And sorry, the whole time I'm thinking, what are we going to do with a million squiggly light bulbs? They weren't the kind of company that could necessarily point to anything on our list other than water or something general that they would be buying from somebody else like Walmart or Home Depot or whomever. But then they said, hey, you know, we don't really carry any of this stuff and that's really, uh, you know, not our forte, but what we can do is guess what? We've got a shelter. What? Yeah, there's a 100 person shelter. It's on our RTP campus. It's a building that y'all can use as a shelter. It has showers, it has hot food uh, and service support. It has, it has um, bathrooms, it has a kitty area. We're just saying, if you need it, you can have it. Put it on the board. Do you know, you know what I mean? So, so I, I guess what I'm saying is, I try not to restrict them. This isn't a very, it's a very inexact science. Giving the private sector the freedom to, to offer whatever they want, when they want. Giving them access to WebEOC that they can post whatever they're offering this disaster. Um, some companies can't, may not be able to give this time, but they can next time. But I try to give them the guidance of these are the things that folks are asking for. These are the things that the VOHADs have asked for in the past. These are the things that communities have needed. These are the things that faith based have asked for. You know, I give them that. It may not be what we get. Now, I will say that uh, we are rarely told no. Now, if that's because of my sparkling personality or my naturally curly hair, I can't say. But we are rarely told no. Um, I have asked, well, I have asked for things that uh, I was very surprised that they answered. So uh, example, um, you needed tie back suits. I, I, I'm gonna go back and tell you guys the story because I have to. Um, we needed tie back suits for mucking out of houses. And I believe that was Hurricane Matthew. Um, Home Depot and, and uh, Lowe's only had so many at that level that we needed them. I forgot what the qualification they, they they rate those Tyvek suits like, you know, this much dust, this much mud, this much whatever it is. Um, and we only had between the two stores about 225 in the state. Because I'm talking to the crisis command centers of both and they said, I got 110, talk to Home Depot. Oh, we only got 75. So I, I started being concerned about it with the numbers that we needed. And so I got on the private sector operational call because we were on a call with them every single day. Phone call, listening to what they need, them listening to what's going on with us and just kind of connecting the dots because it isn't all about donations. Keep in mind, we're trying to keep businesses going. They're, they're trying to keep fuel coming in and the power on and we, all this stuff is happening. And I said to them, um, hey guys, I need to put out a particular need from X County. They're looking for Tyvek suits. And right now I know I got 210 in, in the state. So I'm looking to see if you guys have some because I don't know what they have. And I said, and I'm, I'm looking to see who might be able to help. And I just dropped it. And the next day I got a call from someone that wasn't even a member of the BEOC. It was, um, it was Dow Corning, it was Dow. Hey, person, it's Jeff at Dow. I've been getting your messages because somebody's been forwarding them to me. Very cool what y'all are doing. I heard you need Tyvek suits. You know, we make those. Whoa. Yeah, you guys make those. We do. 
tell me what you need. I said, well, I need about 400 or it was some crazy amount. I said, I need about 450, 450. Okay. What sizes do you need? I don't know. Give me some X, 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 super X and a couple XXX smalls. And, and you know, I don't know. I said, give me a merit of that. Okay. I tell you what, I'm writing that down. I, I've got what you need and uh, they'll be there tomorrow. They'll be there tomorrow. He said, yeah, can give me the contact of where they need to go. And he didn't have access to what he'll say. And they overnighted 400 Tybex suits to the county. And that's what we need by speed to the need. Even if we had done an emergency purchase order for logistics to buy them, they wouldn't have gotten there as fast as a drop ship from the manufacturer. And that's the kind of speed we're talking about. So these are some of the companies or some of the, sorry, the sectors that are represented in the BEOC. Uh, these are some of the companies. I tried to put them on a slide. It's not all inclusive. And I got a second slide of a few more. And yeah, one more slide. <laughs> about 1,300 companies. I told you guys that. This is our concept of operations. Fascinating. Yes, you can read it yourself later. Let me talk to you about the assets board. This is what it looks like, our assets board. And as you can see, we've got some weird things on here. Probably most interesting um, coordinated, cross-coordinated um, uh, delivery that I made was a airdrop to a medical end of life shelter in Burga during Hurricane Florence. There were about eight or nine patients there and they had their caregivers there and some of the children of the caregivers were there. Well, they only anticipated being there for three days or something. The water rose, no access. They had only enough of the support for those folks that were in, in, in the life stage for those three days. And when they reached out, it was the EM coordinator. You know, you can imagine in a couple hospitals saying, can't get to them, this is where they are. We're monitoring those people by radio or somewhere they were connecting with them. So uh, between uh, North Carolina long-term care, some of our pharmacies, some of our big health care, because now we're connected with Humana and Cardinal and Blue Cross Blue Shield, big health care kind of heard about what y'all were doing in North Carolina, they kind of jumped on. They, they heard about it somewhere, because they jumped on with us. Um, and um, a couple of the retailers like uh, uh, Target, Walmart, put together what those people needed in that long, in that uh, into life shelter. And I ran down the hall to the North Carolina Air, Bo well, uh, Air Boss, we call him the Air Boss, Air National Guard. Uh, and we did a helicopter rope drop down to Burga with all that stuff. And yeah, I had flashback of those army days. You know, I, I did have flashback for a few minutes, but the I think the big news was that they got what they needed for the next 10 days to withstand uh, being there, as well as some of the particular needs for that population in the medical shelter. And 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 and, and as you can see there, that is it is on the SS board, but I'll show you on the the uh, resource tracker where we assign that to those people on that rope drop and the air boss and permission. You know what I mean? There's a, there's a record of it is what I'm saying. So someone else like you or you could come into the BUC and do it uh, this season if you need to. Um, but the kind of stuff on the assets board, you see stuff like, um, this is from Florence, BB&T Bank with water, um, big dehumidifiers and big fans. We've been getting that. Sometimes from big garden companies, the big commercial grade dehumidifiers, candy, right? Um, I said that we've had uh, fixed wing aircraft, we have. Uh, we've had uh, search and rescue boats. Um, that was stuff I didn't ask for, but I, I didn't say no. But um, just to give you an example, and this is another part of the list. This was pages long. I put a few of them in here for y'all so you could see. This listing has, um, oh yeah, there it is, Hawthorne Gardening. I never heard of Hawthorne Gardening Company. Anybody ever heard of them? But they had like 53 commercial grade dehumidifiers. And they said, hey, now they were on loan. They wanted for a donation. They were on loan. They would come and pick them back up. Now, we took on the we take on in the BEOC the responsibility of demobilizing that stuff. So it's uh that's part of the job. This is that resource request I was telling you about. The airdrop is at the top, and this is how the BEOC assigns two companies. It is a drop-down menu insert inside resource tracker with all of the private partners, and we can sign up to any one of them. They can go in themselves and mark whether something is in progress, in route, on scene, or complete. And there's another page of it.
So uh, that's the end of the BEOC portion of my presentation. And um, I don't know how much time I have. How am I doing on time? Okay. Well, I wanted to just uh, I wanted to take a a, a little time with y'all to talk to to just give you some success stories because I think that's the best illustration of what can happen here in the BEUC. Now, I'm not saying that all the all of the challenges have been ironed out because they have not. Um, now, with this group in this new office, with working with Val with CERT, uh, yeah, I mentioned earlier uh, one of my goals will be to figure out how we enhance each other, how we coordinate those three groups, and how we innovate, and how we build capacity, and how we build resiliency in, with, within these relationships. I foresee that if you guys, uh, I think, have more exposure to the private sector, especially if you connect with them in the response or in blue skies, because we train together. They come in for exercises. We are communicating with them all the time, and you have to if you're going to maintain a group this large and they're going to stay active, right? I think that it is an opportunity for the North Carolina VOEDs and Faith Bakes, as I said, to you know to really build relationships, especially companies that have a soft spot for them. You know what I mean? Uh, because I think that um, a lot of these companies um, they get a, a bit of cold feet when they have to do something like donate to um, a particular fund that makes them feel as if someone's going to label them. You know what I mean? They're, they're trying to be really careful. So, but if they have a relationship with you and your group, then you would be going through the, philanth the philanthropic arm of their company, and then they would be talking to you and communicating you in gray skies or blue skies. So that's sort of a, that's my little dream y'all. I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I have a question. Um, do you receive donations throughout the year, even um, when we are in blue sky or with a long term recovery process, or is just when we activate for major disasters? Right. You know, I mentioned earlier, the, the big challenge has been that a lot of these companies, their policy is that they are able to give, provide certain donations or provide certain support when there is a declaration of emergency and before that expires. Whereas you know, by the time we get to long-term recovery, the declaration is expired a million years ago. So a lot of companies are that way. And I think that, you know, I'm not trying to pick on Walmart, but they're a primary example of that. They are an amazing partner. They have provided, oh my goodness. If I had to guess, I would say that they gave upwards of $500,000, actually upwards of, more like $800,000 in cash and merchandise and supplies and whatever during Hurricane Florence in the first three weeks of Hurricane Florence. The minute the declaration of emergency expired, it tied their hands on what they could help with. Now they still came back and gave a little on uh, folks that were just, there was a program, what was the name of it y'all? You gave people like a basket of things to get their home back started. It had like coffee and paper towels and toilet paper. And it, it was like a coming home basket, I think is what we called them. They did a few of those, but not on the scale that they could have. So um, I, I guess what I'm saying is my personal goal was looking at their policies, their internal um, uh, restrictions, guidelines that they had and say, how can we look at what's placed on the assets board and how can I convince you, and I've done this in the past, to leave that on the assets board on offer to me at least for the next 30 days. You know what I mean? I've got to go baby steps. I know that's not long. I know that's not our, our long-term recovery time frame, really. But if I'm talking about somebody saying, I got a hard stop as soon as this expires, to get them to extend that offer, can we still grab those items on offer from you within 30 days of the expiration date? And I've been massaging that with a number of companies, and I think they're willing to do that for us. But I'll tell you guys, right now, I think they're willing to do that for us because it's us because we communicate at a high level, because we invite them into the EOC, because we partner, we really partner heavy. And I don't think, I think it would be harder to maybe get that done in, a, in, a, in another, some of our sister states. 
and and I, and I think it's important for y'all to know this is unique. You know, I, I told that this is unique. This is the only we are the only BEOC that's operational in this way. You know, we are the only BEOC that are that we're up. We're partnering at this level and, and, and for context, which I think is important that you all you know, when as when I was running the BEOC and um, and now having it under me is kind of a different perspective. I'm trying to switch gears, but when I had that. This group of private partners and this program saved the state of North Carolina. Up to about the time the pandemic started, because I stopped counting then a, a little over $40 million in supplies, equipment, warehouse space. I mean, I could go on with fixed wing aircraft or whatever. The point of it is the private sector is willing to help. we even with the limitation of when this declaration expires, we're done. They still managed to save North Carolina, the state over $40 million in six years. And I was, and I don't, I didn't have any staff. I was one woman show. So I, I'm trying to paint a picture for you guys that it is still growing. I haven't given up on the possibilities. That's why I'm talking about the partnerships between you and you and you and some of these companies can maybe push them into that longer term situation because then it would be their philanthropic arm. It wouldn't be we are responding to this disaster, but it would be we are supporting this group or this church group or that church group on this project. So I'm we're trying to build a bridge. So so um, going back, thinking about the the question or the petition that uh, Joita posted on on the chat that they have 128 cases I saw know. that and, and they're from Hurricane Florence. Florence yes and this means that there is a need for I know. things items so what are the best uh, or suggestions you can give to these local organizations how to really connect and develop those relationships so they can use that private sector during the long-term recovery time to try to um leverage all of you know that donations from that i mean i think it takes a um i mean i want you guys to understand this wasn't overnight i mean it took me a long time to get to this place where we could call up some company and say we need x and get that it, it wasn't a you know it, it and that's because um some of them have to get permissions for certain levels of giving i get it and it makes sense we also remember our mission was not donations our mission was to keep businesses in business so they could support communities, support people that are sheltering in place so they wouldn't have to be sheltered, so they wouldn't need whatever. You know, we're talking about the people that that could support themselves, except there's no power, no food, no diapers, no pharmacy, that kind of thing. That was our primary focus so that communities could stand back faster. So the <coughs> bounce back time was shorter. And the fact that as far as we're willing to go in terms of partnering, opened up this massive door for donations. That's very nice, but I'll tell you guys, I, I didn't even ask for donations in the first three years. I was, I mean, I was open to them, but my focus was helping those companies. But look what happened when my focus was, when I was focused on helping those companies stay in business to help the communities, those companies came back full force calling me saying, Persia, we want to do something, what do we do? Now, and I want to tell you, a lot of that ended up in cash donations that I only track partially. I know that sometimes they would call and say, hey, we just want you to know that, you know, we just gave this group 500,000, that group 300,000 to this group. And I tracked that for a while. Um, but I'll tell you what was impressive to me um, when I would hear from somebody like BP Oil and they would say, hey, uh, hey, person, I want you to know we're sending our representative down there. We decided to give a $1.2 million donation, which they did during Florence. And we're coming to the EOC because we want to take a picture with the big check and you know do all that and i said let me call the governor's office so i <laughs> i called who the person that was in Luz's position at that point and said hey can you come and get receive this check which they did now you know that check must have ended up in where disaster fund right so then those groups would have had to request um some support and i know they wouldn't have known about these 128 families or 127 families at that time because that's long long-term recovery where we are now but um i look at something like that and think that hey if these folks like walmart like some of these others that have been given a direct resource request to drop water somewhere say to where catholic charities was having a barbecue then the catholic charities person right there i would be right there 
ready to meet BBT or whomever it is to say, hey, you know what? Catholic Charities would love to partner with your company. We love what you're doing here. You know, you don't have to be Catholic, although we'd love to talk to you about being Catholic, but we would love to partner with you. Let me give you my card and do that relationship building right there. Because in 18 months, when those 120 families are looking for them, that person can go back and say, hey, John, you know, you brought me water. I got 128 families that need homes and you know what we would need? Can you help us with X? And he's got a direct connect. It's warmer than a cold call. And he remembers, that man remembers being out there and what Catholic Charities was doing for all those people. And that, and, and, and your person remembers that guy coming with the, with the help. And that's why I mean, in this, these families that are hanging out here like this that we can't find solutions for, I think we have to build up to what that solution is, but I don't think it's a cold call to somebody saying, hey, um, can you help these people? Because here are the questions they ask when I ask those questions. Well, what was this from? What well, is this from Hurricane Florence? They said, that was 2018. That's what they'll say to me. We are trying to connect that with some disaster and something on the community right now that we can justify through our policies in, in 2014 or 2018. We can't. I mean, I don't have the solution, y'all. I'm just generating the movement in the brains and tell you guys where we're kind of directing our efforts. So any other questions for me? I don't want to bore, I don't want to, I can go on and on and I don't want to. I'm trying, I'm trying to slow down. It's not caffeine, but I, I'm trying to, you know, slow it down. Any other questions? Um, okay. Yes, ma'am. When I was in your Hanover, we were actually trying to duplicate the VEOC in our local community, like with partnering with our local businesses. Is I'll I'll be the first one to tell you it was some of our private entities that helped us get through Florence. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that was such a hot commodity at one point was fuel. Everybody was running out of fuel, some of the critical infrastructures. And it was one of our fuel suppliers, major fuel suppliers in town that said, hey, I don't have any people on site because they all evacuated, but I got fuel in tanks. If you can figure out how to get it out, you can get it. So, you know, that really began, and they're part, they're LEPC partners. So, so you've got a partnership with them now. So after Florence, I went to the LEPC partners because I was the chair at the time. And I said, OK, we need to begin to build an asset list amongst all of you guys, mm -hmm. because you guys are the ones that helped us out of, in a pinch during Florence. And I know that, you know, we can help you when you need help, but there may be times that we need you to help us. So that's kind of how we began to start that conversation with that particular group. Oh, that's fantastic. What was the response? I'm curious. What was the response to y'all? Um, well, you know, just like anybody else, you know, these were our, our hazardous chemical facilities. Yeah. Well, now we don't want their hazardous chemicals. We, they can keep all that. But there's, you know, some of them had assets that if they didn't need them, they would be more than willing to help out. So, you know, a lot of the businesses were like, yeah, we'll now I left before it all finished. Gotcha. So I'm not sure where they all are in that process. But my question to you um, as a local emergency management person um, in our county, we're a small county, but there's still businesses. Would you recommend every community? I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, we could start this on a small scale where you'd start it statewide. We, we, each one of the counties could start it on a small scale, building these relationships, building these partnerships with the local businesses. That, that's exactly, uh, oh man, that's exactly um, what I would like to see happen, especially if in your particular county, you have got a uh, homegrown company there. Like for instance, Haynes, big Haynes manufacturing plant out there in Winston-Salem, man. Haynes would be my friend if that's where I was working. 
You know what I mean? I would know everyone there and I would invite them to anything we did. And if we were going to have, I don't know, a helicopter, blah, 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 I would invite everybody there because the more your partner in the true sense of partner, not just I call you and I need something because I had a real problem with that. I had a real problem with I'm going to call you and I don't know you when I need something. So I'm going to tell you guys what I typically say. And, and this might be an explanation for the reputation that I might have. And that is um, government is fond of doing something that none of us would approve of. And that is, and when I say government, I'm talking, when, when I'm saying it in this context, I'm talking about uh, anyone uh, that doesn't know you, uh, you know, when I speak of government, they, are, they always make to private sector fourth date requests on the first date. Now you wouldn't stand for that. You wouldn't stand for that. You wouldn't stand for that. But that's what they do. Never seen them, never talked to them, come out of the blue sky. And I had to smooth over a lot of things when I got into this role of folks that say, oh, I never, you know, we only heard from you guys when you want something. On this or a situation report on that and you don't want to share. But at the level that we're sharing, now this door is wide open. And I think then therefore open to you. So to your point, yes, I think that um, cultivating those relationships right in your county is going to be key. I have talked to the Target guys, the Walmart guys and Home Depot guys and said, hey, what if our county people come over and meet your store manager and your store manager and your store manager? Yeah, they said, yeah, come on, we are. And the beauty of it is when you have something weird happen just in your county, that's who you can call. Exactly. And it's and it's true. And they will do things for you that they wouldn't do for other people. You know, it's snowing or frosting and you need ice. Oh, they'll wrap it up and put it to the front for you. I mean, it, it, in, and, and they will. And I, I do condone that and I agree with that. And right now, me and James Wong are doing a tag team. Uh, we're trying to get to the LEPCs and just speak to them, talk to them about the BEOC. Just say, hey, y'all just want you to know. And to try to draw in private sector to those LEPC meetings which we're going to have to do something about that being hazard focused because I think we could get a lot more companies in those meetings if it wasn't so. I'm not trying to change policy. I'm not trying to change policy, FEMA. Quit writing that down. But if we could change that into a broader local group, and APA would not have to deal with that one. And then I think, I, and then I like that connect to long term recovery groups. That's what, that's what I'm standing right here. there. Because what I was going to say is what will make that equation stronger and better is if we have our counties also including the long term recovery groups and connecting in them that to LEPC. Those private sectors mm -hmm. at the local level and introduce them as, hey, you know, activation is over. Here is a group who is going to be overseeing the recovery process for whatever long it takes. That's right. Um, that introduction will be better than them trying to reach out to them on their own. And not only that, you'll be able to keep that, that company abreast of who's suffering. Like right. these 127 families out here, people need to know about that. If somebody that you're partnering with knew 127 families and they did what? Somebody's going to listen to that story. You know, and somebody's going to find a way. You know what I mean? But it's if people, you know, maybe enough people don't know. The other issue is that length of time. You know, just because I've dealt with a lot of companies, that's a hard sell for a company on it's been four years. This is still a problem because they come back to me and say, but aren't there social programs dealt with that? And, I, and then I said, you know what? Uh, hold, let me let me connect you with FEMA. Because when you don't know, you you say, hey, and we call FEMA. So um, but you guys get my point. If we can move quickly and yes, there is a, a bridge that has to be built to recovery and I've been able to do it in the short term. But when you're talking about 18 months, come back and help me with X. That's a tough one for someone just because they can't justify it on their own internal policies. Would you volunteer to be our mentor through this process? <laughs> I I would if you guys have cupcakes. <laughs> oh, I can I can make sure we got cupcakes. That would be the currency. Um, I, but I warn you. Um, and this is just so y'all understand. Um, right now, um, uh, I'm mentoring about 19 states on this. Um, I'm honored to do that. Um, we also provided about 70% of the input in the 2021 uh, FEMA Private Public Partnership Guide for 2021. Uh, just given the input for information sharing guide, that is a supplement to the first 
which just finished National Review and theme, but that should come out by mid fall. Uh, I would say that North Carolina Emergency Manage, we are probably 95% on that guide. And then uh, and then I wrote, uh, I, I provided the input for the uh, BEOC operational guide, which FEMA is going to put out at the end of the year. Um, so you guys see how hard FEMA is working me? It's not right. Um, but I get it. You, we're the only group right now that's operational this way. And I and I get it. And, and we've been very successful. But this next step for me, the, the next hire would be to incorporate North Carolina boys. So and that was gonna be my, my, my next we're working on how, how the how of it is going to be as I said this isn't overnight you know I would say that we were I say it would take it took me um from opening the BEOC to operational when I started this job 18 months and that was 100% all the time that was you know hey honey wake up and let me bounce this idea out for you you know in the middle of the night that was that was going 100 miles per hour and I'm three months in and I already see where we want to go. So uh, we'll figure it out. We're going to lean on our very smart federal partners. We're going to just drain them of every bit of knowledge they might have. Uh, no, we're, we'll, we're going to kick doors down. We're, we're going to, that's what's going to happen, y'all. This will be a kick the doors down best practice if we're able to do it. But we, we got we to gotta prove it and, and show it by the success uh, in our communities. I just wanted to share one thing. Florence changed my mindset on, well, Florence enforced a fault that I had to begin with, and that was every community has to be able to be self-reliant as long as possible. Because Florence taught us, I mean, we had a few air operations as well. Planes landed in part of mall parking lots to drop off stuff. And because for three days, no one could get to us, we couldn't get to anyone. And so our message in the county that I was in at the time changed. You know, the, the original message is for everybody to be able to take care of themselves for the first 72 hours. Well, our message changed after Florence for our community at that time to be able to take care of themselves for the first seven to 10 days. And so in order to do that, we've got we've got to help build more resilient communities that's it and and we and that's speaks back to if businesses are still operating and you can still get baby formula and you can still get your prescription and you still get gas you know what i mean you can make it you can make it which is what as i said the first mission of the buc was and we still have that mission and because we have done that that has built that strong relationship with us and the companies because they know that we will do anything in the government's power to help keep them operational so that they can be active and functional in the communities that they serve and that and, and that was our point so uh so i'm a, i'm gonna i'm gonna close out y'all with um i handle re-entry certification too by the way i mean well i don't anymore but i'm passing it on but i wanted to um just say to y'all uh, uh just a few other slides that i think are important to take with us you know, I, I said private sector loves NCEM right here, and I say it's because they've got access to significant events, what do you see? So they've got real-time information, even if the county posts it and they say the county says, we got this many people in trouble. Those C-suite people are hearing that, and that's who you want to hear that information, right? So real-time information on, um, on the state of emergency, uh, transportation waivers, on curfews, on evacuations, they're getting all of that information, situation reports, road closures, you know, power restoration status, and that's in real time with a direct RSS fee with, with Duke and WebEOC. Um, and they're getting, um, um, they're getting all of that whenever they want it, and they've got access 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all the time. So we're the only state doing that. So that's why North Carolina is priority when we're looking for something. So Jesus, we just partner. We're loving up on them. We're doing what we do to to make them feel, you know, to make them understand how important they are to us, and that they keep those their stores going. So they support community stabilization, and obviously, and they get disaster reentry certification with us too, which is free. And we remain the only state with a statewide disaster reentry certification program right now. Now, does it work? Yeah. Uh huh. Well. So quick on the numbers, Hurricane Matthew, October 2016, right? Y'all remember that. We coordinated 60 truckloads of support. This was Cumberland County, 
water treatment place plant failed in Cumberland County. Um, we get a, a, a posting a web EOC from Cumberland County EM coordinator saying, hey, we're going to lose water. Um, we're going to lose water pressure in four hours and water all together in six hours. And we anticipate it will be about 75% of the county and Fort Bragg. It was just a post and significant events. And I was looking at it in the BEOC and then two seconds later, I get a phone call in there. Hey, Burger, this is Butch at the uh, North Carolina Beverage Association. You know, we're looking at Web EOC. We see Cumberland County is going to be in trouble. And they're in trouble now. Yeah, Butch, they are. Well, I just want you to know that the Beverage Association guys, our partners, uh, Coca-Cola and Pepsi Bottling said they'll switch over to water right now. We can have water in Cumberland in four hours. So when you say go, we're going to pack it up. I said, whoa, whoa. I said, I want you to go to Web EOC right now. I'm going to walk you through. Post this to my board. Well, how much you want me to guess? To start me off with 500,000 units of that. He said, great. Well, we, we, we've got everything we need, but on your go, I'm going to wait on you. So you guys know I ran in here and told the director, hey, sir, I got the water solution on Cumberland. I need um, the, the Cumberland County EM coordinator to uh, put in a resource request for it. And then he did. Well, logistics was not going to answer 500,000 in four hours. Bottles. Send it to me and I'll tell y'all for the next 11 days. I coordinated every morning distribution of water 11, 10, 11, 12 trucks a day to Cumberland County. We stacked it at the high school and at the Coliseum and we put it over at the middle school and we put it at this church here. And until they said no, until they said stop sending water, we did it for 11 days. And that's how the BEOC got operational. That is how people saw, holy cow, guess you know what? Perhaps I can get in this, this fight. And so that's what kicked the door down for us. So there's the rest of it. Uh, about $9 million donated to North Carolina VOS into the governor's fund. That was cash donations from them. And we did about 800 free prescriptions to survivors in state shelters. Free. That was, y'all, that was straight up just a blessing from God. And, 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 and everyone wanted to know how you get free prescriptions. And I said, you know, you got you to gotta be nice to people. I don't know what else to say. Be nice to people, right? Um, Meals from emergency responders, um, people like um, uh, Outback Steakhouse. Um, I called them, um, what well, they called me. They, they heard about the State Highway Patrol who was out there at the at the barricade. I felt bad for them. And I said, hey, y'all, you know, I'm feeling bad for the Highway Patrol. They're out there at the barricades. They won't leave the barricades because people keep going around them and drowning. So they won't leave their post. I said, and then I said, you know, I remember walking the post and being hungry. And I, 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 uh, I'm really feeling them and Outback called and said, hey, we got the highway patrol. We're going to send chicken and steak dinners. We're going to package it up and salad and drinks. And sorry, the blooming onion won't travel. <laughs> <laughs> and as y'all can see that picture right there, that's them. They were delivering it to everybody on post to highway patrol. Until this day, if anybody else tries to feed the highway patrol, I get a call from the headquarters at uh, Outback saying, hey, you know, now, you tell uh, the pizza pizza people that we don't appreciate <laughs> them feeding our highway patrol. We feed the highway patrol. They went on and on. I said, you know what? You're right. You are right, sir. <laughs> I will tell those pizza people guys to back off. He said, that's right. <laughs> and to this day, they, they have claimed the highway patrol. See how that relationship happened? I didn't do anything else. But the highway patrol will never go hungry because of that. And that's the Coca-Cola guys you see distributing the water down uh, further south. Okay, Hurricane Florence. Hurricane Florence. Uh, oh, that's my picture uh, over I-95. Ah, cross-sector coordinated the airdrop. I told you all about that. Uh, Power up from Duracell donated 1 million batteries. We did 88 resource requests. Uh, private sector did over $18 million in commodities and over $20 million cash donations. And that's when we were named a model by FEMA that year. Hurricane Dorian. Sorry. Um, uh, private sector supported state managed uh, mass care and sheltering. They tricked out. That's what my son says. They tricked out the state shelter. shelter. They did tables, chairs, CO2 alarms, refrigerators, kids toys, Xboxes, um, charter communication put in high speed internet in a 280,000 square foot Sears building. For, for for the state shelter. So I'm just giving you all examples. Uh, EZAS, oh, sorry, skip one. Um, 
donated food and water. And, you know, this was a smaller one, if you might recall. But the difference here was I, uh, I, I did, we did something called non-concrete shelter. Yeah, that was from COVID. Right. For us, um, I partnered with about 300 hotels, 271 signed an MOA with us. I, I tell you what, I guess you don't get you don't get anything unless you ask. Or what is it they say in Vegas? You can't win if you don't gamble or something like that. Wrote this MOA, I asked for the world. I said, hey, hotel partners, love you. Would you give us a state rate, first right of refusal, and a 72-hour hold if we have a disaster so we don't have empty rooms? And they agreed to that. 271 of them agreed to that. So by easy AS, y'all, um, uh, uh, just before landfall, day before landfall, we had 3,050 rooms that belonged to us that were free, 72-hour hold. We need them or not. They weren't going to charge us. State rate after that. It's just got to be nice people, right? So, And then COVID, I told you all about the reefer trailers. Um, gosh, we did so much PPE. I, ha I stopped counting. I stopped counting after that. So I, I, I just wanted to show you that, that kind of the what we've done. And I've been going and going, and I'm going to go have a little lay down now. <laughs> <laughs> well, final questions for me, and I, I'm out. Thank you all for listening. I appreciate what you do. You'll hear where we are. We'll keep you posted. So I guess the lesson learned today is be friendly and ask. Um, and I, I, I just wanted to touch on the, the, the money part, the donations, monetary donations, and just say that, yes, Volunteer NC in the past has uh, managed all um, monetary donations through our disaster relief fund. And usually that fund is channeled through one of our partners who is here today present um, from the United Way of North Carolina. So uh, we have it an MOU in place and they help us distribute that funding um, in the impacted communities. So that's just to close that information that was put out there. And so we, it is 11.04. Um, the next presentation was supposed to start at 11. So we're just gonna go ahead and roll on to the next presentation. If you need a break, feel free to walk out of the room. Um, but let me go ahead and pull the next presentation. Let's see. Hello, Alice. And she is going to be virtual with us. Let's see. And she's saying hello. Thank you, Bersha. And this next presentation is on warehouse management. And let me, oh gosh, why can't I find, oh, here you go. Okay, Elise, um, whoo, how are we gonna work this out with the speakers? I'll just, I'll just tell you. No, because next. the people in the room needs to hear. Oh. Oh. And, um, the, Anybody here is tech, tech uh, expert that can help us figure out how to get this um, microphone working for the, the this piece? Because she's going to be. Um... Can you hear me just on your computer? I can hear you from the computer, but um, it's connecting um, the speaker so that the people that are in person can hear you. Persia, where is the, the technical support people's um, office? Right here to your left on those double doors. Okay. And first door on the left. Okay. Yeah.
No, it's on the HDMI, which I assume yeah. goes to these speakers. Yeah. It's the house speaker. Is you say is the house speaker? Yeah, because it? Mm. That's working. Okay. Um, Elise, can you try speaking? Hey, can you hear me? Mm. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you, but um, yeah. through the computer. Huh? Can you hold up a mic or something? Oh, yeah. Gotta love technology. I know, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just. Let me see, can we move? Maybe, um, whenever we had the BOAD meeting there, I feel like it was something in the back that we had to switch yeah. to have the screen for people to talk. Yeah, they did not connect us to the back, and so that's oh, okay. why we are encountering these issues. Oh no, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think what the alternative would be. Yeah, I requested technical support, so somebody should be here hopefully okay. soon. But um, do you want to go ahead and um, do Catholic Charities first, and then I can go right after them? Um, Daniel, are you ready to present? Because we can we can have you do it first, and then the, she can come after you. I can get started. And I do have the presentation of Emily, who's going to be virtual as well. Okay. Uh, but I can go through the beginning of it and see if we get technical support by the time. Okay. Uh, Sounds great. Thank you. <laughs> I'll stay tuned. <laughs> Thank you, Elise. Okay, so let's yep. close this one. You gotta love technology. Okay, so Little change of plans with the agenda. We are going to have Catholic Charities next, and um, and Elise will come after. Let's see. Okay. And um, for Catholic Charities, we will have uh, Daniel Altonen and Emily Hart doing the presentation on points of distribution. Ready? Yep. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, so as Lou said, my name is Daniel Altano. I'm the Director of Communications and Disaster Services for Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Raleigh. I've been in my role for about 10 years now. Um, and so a lot of what will be shared on this presentation about some key principles of points of distribution will be lessons learned over the past 10 years, specifically from Hurricane Matthew and Hurricane Florence. Um, as well as this is a presentation that has been collaborated on uh, through the Catholic Charities Network and with Catholic Charities USA. So there are lessons learned um, from across the country uh, incorporated in this as well from our Catholic Charities Network. Um, our, my co-presenter uh, is going to be Emily Hart. 
um, who is our Cape Fear Regional Director, um, so covering that southeast part of the state. Um, and again, she's been with us for eight years now um, and was heavily involved in Hurricane Matthew and Hurricane Florence as well, um, and has operated her fair share of points of distribution um, and also some practice exercise points of distribution. And so we're going to cover uh, a couple of steps uh, around a little bit of an introduction into points of distribution, setting up a pod, operating a pod, demobilizing a pod, and then some special uh, considerations around a point of distribution. One of the things that I will mention is the presentation we're sharing today is just a small aspect of a presentation that and a training that we offer that's an all day training uh, that we offer to community partners, uh, houses of worship. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do is share these best practices with local community partners um, so that as many of our neighbors can be prepared to operate points of distribution after a disaster. Um, so we're just going to touch on some highlights very quickly run through the presentation here. Uh, but if anyone is interested in scheduling a more in-depth training uh, with your community following this, please reach out to myself or Emily, uh, and we're happy to be good partners and collaborate um, and provide this training to others uh, so that more, more community partners are in a position to uh, operate points of distribution, really looking to emphasize that all disasters start and end local. Um, and so we want as many of our local partners to be trained up on this as possible. Um, so the first thing we'll start with is just what is a pod? What is that abbreviation? What is a point of distribution? Um, and it's going to be a place where we'll set up the uh, to meet the immediate needs of community following a disaster. Um, and what makes pods unique um, from the other ways that we may distribute services throughout the year uh, and specifically in disasters um, is really making sure that we get those life sustaining supplies in areas that are accessible uh, to the survivors. Um, so really look into and it was touched on earlier uh, by Chris. Um, wanting to find a balance uh, of location where it's accessible and we'll talk more uh, a little bit later in the presentation about finding the right location, um, but bringing resources into communities that have been impacted and kind of getting outside of our necessarily brick and mortar traditional uh, places where we distribute supplies. So as the day today is about uh, planning ahead is going to be the most important thing that we work on um, and really trying to take time during blue skies to be prepared to respond during uh, or following a disaster. And so some questions that we would be asking ourselves over the summer and kind of leading into hurricane season are going to be what resources are available to our organization um, and what agreements do we have in place to ensure that we're able to offer uh, services following a disaster. Um, and as we plan um, and create ideas of how we want to provide services after a disaster, disaster the most important uh, word that we use is scalable. Uh, we want to make sure our plans are able to adapt and provide smaller, more localized events responses um, and also respond to those larger scale FEMA declarations, Hurricane Matthew, Hurricane Florence type events. Um, and we also want to make sure that as we're planning, we're looking at continuity of operations for all the services that we offer. Uh, most of us have programming that we do outside of our disaster services response phase. And so we want to make sure anything that we commit to doing or any activities we take on don't take away from those other programs that we have in place. Um, just because a disaster comes in doesn't mean the needs of families that we're serving outside of a disaster go away. And so we don't want them left out uh, while we're trying to respond to something new that comes. And so we're looking to make sure we can keep that balance in place. Uh, and so first we're going to start with looking at what we're going to do to set up a point of distribution. Um, and the first thing we're going to think about is location, location, location. Um, and so we're going to divide location considerations into two topics. And the first we're going to start with our general logistics. Uh, so what is traffic flow around the site going to look like? Um, and really when you're picking a site location, making sure to consider that. Are you on a really busy road where turning in uh, might be dangerous for some of the families that are trying to access services? We don't want to uh, put families in unsafe situations already in a disaster. Um, or is it a really narrow, really small road where all of a sudden you're having 100, 200 families come onto this two lane road and try to access services. Is that going to create congestion, back things up and again create unsafe situations uh, for the families you're serving? Um, and so in both of those circumstances, 
one of the things might be to coordinate with local authorities, local law enforcement, um, and potentially get support from them or some other entity to help with traffic control uh, to make sure that everyone again is able to access services in a safe way. Along the same lines, is there going to be enough parking? Um, if there isn't enough parking, would that mean people are backing up and forming lines onto those roads? Um, or are people going to park in unsafe situations, just park on the side of the road to try to get access to services? Uh, we want to prevent people from making unsafe decisions or feeling like they need to do that to be able to access services. So we want to make sure that people have safe ways to access services and safe places to park. Um, and then again, smooth operations around inflow and outflow uh, for those cars, for those vehicles, uh, making sure that they're not crisscrossing with each other and causing more congestion than is necessary. Um, and also, we talked a lot about logistics of survivors getting in, uh, but we also need to consider how our donations uh, and our supplies are going to get in uh, before being distributed to the community. Um, are we just shipping in on box trucks that have more maneuverability are we bringing in semi tractor trailers to uh, unload from and if we are bringing in those larger vehicles again will they have the ability to pull in to park to be unloaded to turn around um, before everyone shows up core question you're always going to want to ask at each step um, of the process is what is our mission? What is our purpose with this point of distribution? Um, and try to make sure that the decisions you're making always reflect and align back to that original question. In addition to those general logistical questions about setting up the point of distribution, we also want to have that survivor perspective into location um, and really thinking about accessibility. Um, is there easy access to get in and out to access services? Uh, do we are we taking into consideration any ADA regulations and requirements? Uh, are we setting up any accommodations for survivors so that they can access the services in an equitable way? Um, and then also proximity to the impacted area. Uh, a major selling point for the points of distribution is that they're local, that they're in places that family can access. Uh, but again, as we're talking about active uh, disaster scenes, and especially here with the flooding um, and how long that continued to make situations dangerous here in North Carolina after Hurricane Florence, setting them up in appropriate locations where they were safe, or far enough away from the flooding for people to access services, but reduce that travel time and distance as much as possible uh, for survivors to get the supplies that they need. And then finally, uh, consideration on how people access the point of distribution. This is gonna vary widely, um, really changing a lot from our more rural locations and our more urban locations, uh, but when possible, take into consideration uh, vehicular traffic, how people are gonna drive there, if people are able to walk, uh, what pedestrian traffic would look like, um, and then setting up points of distribution along um, public transportation lines, if those exist in the community. Um, again, making it possible for as many people to access services as possible uh, is something to consider and try to plan around. At Catholic Charities, we've developed three different models for offering points of distribution to serve the community. Um, one is a walk up or shopping pod uh, where we've got different uh, stations where survivors are invited to come in and select what they need. Uh, we really like this model because it can be empowering to families, allows, allowing them to choose what they want um, and start putting control back in their lives early in the response phase uh, when so much has been felt like is out of their control in a disaster um, and you're getting pushed around in all different ways and told what to do, being empowered by saying, all right, here's what we've got. You're able to select what you think is best for your family uh, can really be a nice change of attitude and change of pace for families. Um, but this is a little bit of a slower process that families go through um, and can take a little bit longer uh, to process families. And so that's a consideration to take place uh, in the planning and selection of a model like this. We do also continue to operate that more traditional model where prepackaged items are given out to families. Um, we're able to get more supplies out to families more quickly in this model. And so when that seems to be what is needed at the time to make sure that we're able to assist the needs of how many families are seeking services, we may go to that model where we'll prepackage and kind of uh, 
area before bringing supplies to a site um, and then are able to get uh, more supplies out to families as they come up are able to pick up their boxes maybe do some customization uh, based on local needs but really a uh, more standardized process of in and out getting those prepackaged supplies and then finally, something that was developed during COVID-19 was more of a drive-through model um, when we were trying to take uh, health considerations into account, uh, keep people a little bit more separated. Families remained in their cars as volunteers were able to load supplies into their vehicles um, and kind of drive through, stop at different stations to load up so the line kept moving, um, but was uh, a lot more COVID friendly than the previous two models. Um, so those are kind of three models that we found to be successful and on a situation by situation basis will determine what is best and what we want to set up. And so as we have those three models in mind, um, what we look at as we start planning um, is the size and type of the pod that we want to set up and do those two match. Do we want to serve a thousand people in two hours and select that shopping model? probably not going to match up. It's either smaller amount of people or a longer period of time can go with that shopping model. Um, but if we have a lot of people that we need to serve and maybe in a shorter period of time, we'll lean towards that prepackaged model. Um, we're also going to look at when the pod is going to be open and setting some dates and times um, and having everything match. So we want the model to match how long we have it open. And then we also, the quantity of commodities needs to match how long we're gonna be open. Uh, we don't wanna advertise for an all day event, um, but only bring enough supplies to distribute for two hours. Uh, and a lot of that comes to setting proper expectations with families. Um, families have been through a lot right after a disaster. You don't wanna tell people to travel 10, 20, 30 minutes to come to your point of distribution. And by the time they get there, you're out of supplies to help them. Um, so making sure that as you're putting out advertising that you are properly stocking uh, your events so that uh, families are able to benefit when they arrive. Um, and so making sure you coordinate with your suppliers uh, so that you have those items to distribute um, and think about how are you going to receive those items from your suppliers. Are you pre-staging them at a warehouse or someplace else and then bringing them to the point of distribution? Are supplies being shipped straight to the point of distribution? What time should they arrive there? all of that coordination with whoever the donor is uh, should happen early and as early as possible um, and try to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, and finally, as we're pulling all of our logistics together, a big part of that is the team that's actually gonna make that happen. Um, and so starting to look at recruiting staff and volunteers to operate the pods uh, in the service areas. Earlier today, Chris touched on it a little bit, um, and that question of accepting donations and what are we going to accept. Um, and there are going to be certain conversations you'll have with different groups. Uh, the general breakdown we take at Catholic Charities is looking at our large scale suppliers. Um, so that's some national partners, uh, national foundations where we're getting those palletized uh, items delivered to us. Um, and then also that general community putting out for a food drive or some kind of collections drive at a parish or a church in, or another faith-based group in the community. Um, and most of the time, it's going to be working with a combination of both. You're not going to be able to work exclusively with one or the other, but try to work with both to meet the needs of the community. Um, and one of the important things early on is knowing what you want to collect and getting that message out early. One of the big things we try to avoid at Catholic Charities is saying no to anyone. Um, no kind of ends relationships and we don't want to do that. Uh, but we also don't want to accept a tractor trailer load of student desks that was sent to us after Hurricane Matthew because that's not what we do. Um, and so the way we do that is early on. We've got already flyers, messaging already created about the core services that we're going to offer and what we're going to accept. And so by early getting it out and saying this is what we're collecting, people will self-select out and they see what we're collecting. Oh, you're not collecting student desks. They're less likely to reach out and try to send that to us. And so we don't have to say no to them um, and we can try and be more positive with those relationships and say yes. So in blue sky timing, you can't always plan for everything, but have some ideas of some core things that you're going to do um, and then uh, be able to get that message out as quick as possible. 
and then also that cash is king donation ask uh, is really important um, and we'll get that video from national voad out again um, so that it'll have some talking points and ways to make that a little bit of a softer ask when that some people can be a little bit turned off by requests for cash they'd rather give in kind donations um, also, as Persia had mentioned, there's always the tax implication of donations, more so with your larger suppliers, but some people, individuals, may give large donations as well. And so making sure you have an internal process and everyone is aware that might be collecting donations, what that internal process is for documenting donations and providing some kind of receipt should people want to claim that uh, on their taxes at the end of the year. Um, and then finally, understanding what donor intentions are, again, more so with the large scale suppliers. Um, what are the intentions? Are there any restrictions, maybe geographic restrictions around in-kind donations that they're sending to you? And then assigning someone the responsibility to make sure that that is tracked. Um, donation management can be chaotic um, and donations can get mixed really quickly. Uh, so it's really important that if there are restrictions that those are carted off, that a volunteer doesn't just come see this, say I need this and take it, even if, it, if it's not in for the intended purpose. Um, one of the restrictions or requests that we have from one of our phone funders um, is for pictures to be taken of the supplies as they're going out, not necessarily of the survivors, but of the donations just to for them to be able to promote the work that they're doing. Uh, they if they need to get their donations themselves, and so if they don't have the marketing materials, they can't pass that on to us in future disasters. So it's really important for us to track that and get those documentations, but that's something that if the supplies are all gone at the end of the day and that's when you remember you needed to take photos, there's no going back and recapturing that. So making sure you've got someone in place from the beginning to know and be aware of what those restrictions are um, and track that and make sure they're followed is going to be really important. And so answering that question of what do you want to distribute, what do you want to collect is going to be up to each agency um, and don't want to tell any agency what to do, but uh, we can share what we do at Catholic Charities. Um, we look at things as kind of three phases of the response and into recovery phase. Um, and so early on um, and first things we're going to be prioritizing are life sustaining supplies. So non perishable food and water, making sure that people are able to eat and drink and stay hydrated. Um, but also then quickly moving into a comfort phase as well, uh, providing hygiene items. As people have lost everything, as they're in shelters, as they're maybe in hotel rooms, uh, maybe haven't showered in a few days, maybe haven't done stuff, getting them to feel clean again um, and just being able to get back into a normal routine cleanup uh, as they're going to meet all these people, uh, bringing that back and having that opportunity. So some of those comfort items, uh, and so we do hygiene items, um, that we distribute to families and collect, uh, and then looking into the recovery phase. Um, and so there we'll do household cleaners, shovels, rakes, anything that uh, is needed to kind of start cleaning out that home, cleaning out around the home, uh, so families are in a position for when some of the other nonprofits come in to really do the full muck and gut um, and start the repair process, they've been able to start some of that um, and reduce that on the nonprofit and feel like they've got some again, power over their situation, control over their situation, and can start working towards that recovery. There are also a few things that we will completely avoid. Um, clothing is one of those uh, that can definitely be the disaster after the disaster. Uh, and there are other partners in the community that handle that. And so that is something um, is an absolute no for us that we will really never collect. Um, also looking at furniture, and mattresses and things like that. Uh, those are things that will collect more in the recovery phase, um, but early on, it's just not going to be needed. Um, it's going to realize how long it takes for houses to dry out and be ready for furniture to come back in. Um, many people don't realize that. They've seen all the stuff that goes out onto the roads and is being thrown out, and they want to replace all of it right away. Um, and so we don't want to lose valuable storage space. Uh, storing up furniture and mattresses when more of those life sustaining uh, and comfort items are needed earlier in the response. Uh, so those will be things that we avoid early on and wait until recovery when families are actually able to move back in. 
And so as we, we talked about, now that we know what we're distributing, what we're avoiding, looking, we've got a location picked out, um, staffing that is going to be really important. Um, and so uh, I know this afternoon we're going to be talking more about volunteer management. So we're just lightly going to touch on what that looks like for a point of distribution. Um, and so what we'll do is the steps that we take uh, start with recruiting volunteers um, and getting them into the, loca the locations where they're going to be serving. Uh, in those locations, looking to register them and verify, get them to complete documents um, and for certain positions, complete background checks, uh, start getting them assigned to tasks, training them on those tasks and providing whatever equipment they might need, maybe that some PPE, um, whatever they need to make sure that they can accomplish that task in a safe manner. Um, and then once we're ready, we send them out, um, get them deployed, but also make sure that we monitor them um, and provide supervision, either pairing new volunteers up with experienced volunteers or making sure staff are there to provide the appropriate level of guidance and make it a fulfilling experience for both the volunteers and the families being served. Um, and then finally, as our volunteer experience ends, uh, looking for them to check out, record how many hours they completed, um, and also do a little bit of a mental health check. Uh, many of us that are in the disaster world on a day-to-day -day basis understand what secondary trauma looks like, understand what self-care we need to take place when we go home to make sure we're able to come back the next day. Um, but for some volunteers, they not, may not be as familiar with that. Um, and so we want to do that debrief, making sure that we're taking care of our volunteers so that they can keep showing up and that doesn't wear on them. Um, and so that's the kind of the final step for us. Um, now is when I'm going to see if Emily can take over. Have we heard anything from the IT department? Uh, no, he's on his way back. Um, and he's our IT person. Mm -hmm. oh, let, me, let me get him. I'm going to work around for a speaker. Oh, that yeah. would Since the microphone's working. But, uh, Here, can you guys hear me? We can hold on, but only at the very front of the room. We're, we might have a speaker we're able to connect. Gotcha. I've got um, the expert. You know, the state valve, it's a multi purpose <laughs> person. He's expert then, in a lot of MRI things. And then SC002, VIREDSL. With this many people, we should be able to figure it <laughs> out. Is anybody filming this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How many vowels does it take to? Are you able to get this connected to the sound? Is this a laptop that's not connected? Yeah, so that there's a microphone in the room. Yeah. But it's not coming, the sound isn't coming from here. But if there's Bluetooth, we can connect the speaker and just put the microphone next to the speaker. Yeah. Is this, is this on? It yes. Is. Yeah, volume is pretty low. Pardon the technical difficulties. Emily, do you want to try talking? Yeah, can you guys hear me okay? Where is the speaker? Here it's underneath. All right, maybe we try that one. What's the uh, It's that, it's not this, right? This is, this is, oh, go ahead. No. I heard it. Try Do that something. again. So Emily, try hey talking everyone, again. can you hear me? <laughs> Much better. Testing, one, two, testing. We can make it work. We can put on our listening ears. <laughs> Emily, can you say something again? Yes, um, I'm here. Can you guys hear me now? Oh, because this one's over. Nope. Yes, we can hear you now. Perfect. All right, so you guys ready for me to get started? Hold this because I need to advance. Yes, go ahead. Okay, perfect. All right. So the setup and the operation of a pod, no matter how large or how small your pod is going to be, is going to require a number of staff and volunteer positions. Um, in a smaller or un under-resourced pod, uh, people may have more than one role that you see here listed on the screen. Um, and sometimes jobs may be shared by several people. 
Not every pod operation is going to require all of these roles that are seen on this slide, uh, but agencies and churches can kind of determine their staffing and their volunteer levels based on the demands at their uh, pod location. Next slide. So when you think about staging, um, and I'm going to talk about staging one your warehouse, but also your pod. When you're talking about your warehouse, you might stage it in um, the phases that Dan kind of mentioned. So having your phase one supplies, your life sustaining supplies closest to the bay doors where things are going to be exiting your warehouse. And then um, putting your second phase kind of in the middle section of your warehouse. And then the third phase, phase your cleanup supplies towards the back so that things can kind of cycle in and out um, as the phases go through. Now, for your mobile pods, you might want to st stage multiple loading stations um, with all of the supplies at, available at each station in order to reduce um, the amount of running around that your runners have to do in order to get those supplies. Um, and as Dan mentioned before, you might want to prepack supplies and everyone gets the same commodities. However, um, that can lead to some resource waste if someone doesn't need um, something that you have available. Next slide. So when deciding um, who can access your pod, here are some things to kind of consider with your team. Um, will everyone be able to access your pod or only those impacted by the disaster? And if that's the case, how what will you require in order to prove that? Um, how much how much of the commodities or the supplies can they actually take? Is it going to be um, a uniform kit? Is it going to be based on household size? Things like that. Um, and then how frequently can they access your pod? Um, and that might really um, differ if, um, you know, you're, if you have a shopping pod set up based on phases and one week you're offering one set of supplies, the second week you're offering a second set of supplies, you might want to allow them to come more frequently. Um, and then if you're limiting it, how are you tracking that? Um, the biggest thing, though, I want you guys to take away from this is making sure that all of your staff and your volunteers know all of the parameters of who can access the pod and the frequency and all of those parameters so that that message can be communicated um, the same to everyone that comes and access the commodities. So let's get into operating your pod. So staff and volunteers can maintain their personal safety by making sure that the site is swept um, and keeping work areas free of debris, making sure that you're moving empty pallets out of the way, clearing any trash and tripping hazards, and uh, roping off any area that's not accessible by survivors if survivors can come into the pod. Making sure that everyone is we wearing uh, uh, PPE and have proper attire, such as like clothes, you know, protective footwear, lifting belts, um, especially for your loading staff. And then making sure that you train uh, people who um, are volunteering proper lifting techniques by lifting close to your body with your feet shoulder width apart and lifting from the knees and not from the back. And then making sure that all personnel have access to safety rules and procedures and access fire extinguishers and first aid kits. Um, one of the cool things that we learned from Operation Barbecue Relief was that um, when they're working a site, they actually have a code word that everyone knows if there's an uh, injury or an incident. Um, and when they scream out that code word, every everyone and everything kind of immediately stops to assess the situation and to be kind of all hands on deck. Next slide. So here are, um, if you'll move the slide forward too, Dan. Um, if Here's some things that will be part of your daily operations. So you definitely always want to start with staff briefings, and those are helped to cover your daily concerns, any accidents or incidents that were noted, any other soft safety related topics, but also going over that day's um, duties and tasks. To ensure the smooth delivery or daily operation of the pod, the pod safety manager and other key staff perform um, several daily tasks. They work with volunteer coordinators to ensure that we have sufficient volunteer staffing to cover all pod activities, um, to conduct a daily needs assessment, monitor supply consumption, and coordinate with the warehouse manager to request more commodities as those are getting low. 
And then your pod site manager is also going to provide the communications manager with a daily update of operation hours if those are changing, uh, services, needed supplies, and locations to donate, and any other information that's pertinent to your operations. Now, related to equipment, depending on the size of your pod operation, your equipment needs may be extensive, uh, but budget and availability will determine if the equipment is borrowed, rented, purchased, or needs to be donated. Um, so those are just some common pod operations equipment um, listed on the screen here. And I will say, um, Signage seems like a silly one, but it's so important to help communicate uh, to people um, that are accessing your pods. Next slide. So pod accounting, it is extremely important to use formal accounting system in your pod operation. Um, this may include applying and following existing church or agency financial controls because you want to track donations, your expenses and disbursements, keep a strict accounting of cash and any gift card donations and distribution and conducting daily inventories. Uh, the pod accounting system can also be used to track staffing levels to make sure you have ample volunteers and staff, the supply of those commodities, gift card distributions and equipment. The equipment inventory sheet is going to document the type, the condition and the ownership of each pod equipment um, so that you know who kind of to return it to at the end when you demobilize. Um, the supply inventory sheet tracks items received, distributed, and remaining in stock. If the supplies are inventory daily and communicated appropriately, the warehouse can better kind of maintain an appropriate level of supplies um, because your communications manager can contact donors about supplies that are still needed or no longer required. Because we know how we need something one day in time of a disaster, and then we get a truckload of it three weeks later. So just kind of trying to manage that. Um, but accuracy in this effort really helps to ensure that staffing levels are adequate to the task and that supplies for the public are maintained at needed levels. All right, so when you open up your pod and you start um, serving survivors, people will come into your pod and you will likely use some type of screening or intake form. Now that can be really simple, just like just capturing household sizes, or it might be more in depth to serve as the start of casework. That's really gonna depend on um, how many people are trying to access your pod, because you'll wanna cause backups like Dan was talking about. Um, and then you might want to, um, so pod training and procedures need to address accommodations for survivors with special circumstances that can affect their ability to actually use your pod. So some of those accommodations might be related to language accommodations, limited mobility access, or when you're giving out food, um, medically related dietary needs. But following established procedures while the pod is operational is going to make your site feel safer, more efficient, and less stressful for your staff, your volunteers, and for the survivors who depend on your pod services. Next slide. So if the disaster receives a presidential disaster declaration, the volunteer coordinator may be required to keep a log of volunteer hours to be submitted later to local and state emergency management as part of FEMA's cost sharing program requirements. So making sure the volunteers are signing in and out is gonna be crucial in order to accomplish this. Um, when you're thinking about um, training your volunteers and getting them onboarded um, just understanding you know are you prepared to train pod volunteers as your volunteers might be changing every single day um, what types of ongoing training might be needed in order to continue operations and what training resources do you already have on hand so one of the things that we have is we have access to a 30 minute video that kind of goes over high level pod operations um, that we'll have them watch on their own time uh, but once they complete that then they can then join um, join in and um, we can buddy them up with someone on a specific role or specific task and then have them join daily briefings as well the buddy system has been really successful for us. Next slide. 
And then, so as local infrastructure is starts to be repaired, um, access to food, water, and other supplies improves, the need for a pod is going to start to decrease. So when it's time to close a pod, um, the management team should kind of should uh, use public information outlets available to announce the pod closing so that it's not a surprise to community members. And like Dan talked about wasting resources to drive all the way out to your pod or to walk a mile to your pod. Um, you want to include information on alternative sites for people who continue to base to need those basic supplies. And if possible, try to provide a 72 hours notice before shutting down operations. So some demobilization uh, tasks, you are going to want to find some partners to take your excess supply. So start making those calls for the pods that are still open. Um, and again, having uh, those connections in blue sky days and knowing what other people can kind of take is really helpful. Uh, making sure that we're returning borrowed equipment, uh, cleaning up the facility if you were borrowing it, um, and then submit any necessary paperwork to the proper entities um, to show that we were good stewards of the resources that we received. Now let's talk about just a few troubleshooting and special considerations. Uh, a few trouble spots that I'd like to address um, are um, making sure that, you know, like Dan talked about, people who access our pods are going to have experienced um, some trauma. So one of the things that really helps with crowd morale and crowd control has been maintaining good attitudes through like really cheerful signs, having cheerful greeters. If you're doing a drive through pod to go and check in on cars as they're waiting in line. Um, <laughs> Plan for inclement weather, right? You may need to have some tents on site and some rain ponchos for your volunteers. Um, one of the things that we often see is line cutting. So people are scared that they're going to run out of supplies. So making sure that, you know, you're reassuring them that you're going to have enough and everyone will have access to supplies. Now, if you see that you're starting to run short, um, making sure that you're counting kits. And one of the things that we've done in drive through pods is if let's say we had 45 kits left, we went and counted the cars and we had our traffic control person count the number of cars all the way to car 45. And then after that, told the, the cars after that, please come back tomorrow. We apologize. We'll make arrangements to get you supplies a different day so that they're not waiting in line for, you know, 30, 40 minutes and then not get supplies. Um, and then how will you handle requests for multiples? That's in a whole other one, right? So not everyone has access to transportation. You might be bringing a neighbor in your car with you. Uh, make sure you're clear on if carloads can pick up for multiple families or is it going to be one, one per car only and making sure that you're communicating that uh, through your communications person. Next slide. I think this is back to you, Dan. Oh, all right. Um, so yeah, so just some final thoughts uh, about kind of setting up points of distribution, um, really thinking about uh, when you should be distributing stuff, uh, what falls within your mission, what falls within the needs of the community, um, really making sure that that is all in alignment. One of the things, at least at Catholic Charities, we try to really limit doing is taking on new things during a disaster um, and trying out new things. Sometimes it happens because just the disaster throws something at you where the traditional approaches won't work. Um, but really looking at what is the core mission that you've planned for um, and how can you incorporate that into the needs that have developed. Um, really being careful about those financial controls. Uh, the general public trusts us to be good stewards of what they send to us, and we want to maintain that positive reputation. Um, once that reputation falls away, there have been uh, critiques of certain nonprofits in the past of how things are managed, and that can really damage your reputation, so you want to avoid that. Um, really being proactive in trying to find a distribution venue um, and finding that location that's going to work. Um, and having access to both the goods and financial resources to make sure all of it comes together in a productive and effective way. Um, and then again, making sure you've got those avenues for what staff are you going to use? Are you going to repurpose staff or maybe other programs that you have temporarily come over and help set up a point of distribution? Um, and then same with volunteers. Maybe you've got a cadre of volunteers that can just spring up. Maybe you need to repurpose some volunteers um, and look at how you can do that. 
Um, and again, also, what do you need for supplies, those forklifts, pallet jacks, carts, trucks, trailers, everything to move all these supplies around and get them into the communities where families are uh, being served. Um, and then another big one with all these people coming around uh, areas that you're uh, working around, do you have the appropriate levels of insurance should some accident happen? Uh, things are moving fast. People are moving all over the place. There are heavy objects being moved around. Accidents do happen. And so you want to make sure you as an agency are protected and covered yourself. Um, and so to accomplish all of that, organization is the key to success. Um, and that starts now in blue sky times and planning and events like today. Um, really having everyone on your team trained and aware, both staff and volunteers. The more people you get trained up now, the more smooth it'll go when an event happens. Um, having that communications team in place so you can get the right information out to the public um, and again setting proper expectations um, and then also keeping track of that burn rate how quickly are you going through your supplies how are you going to reorder or do you need to put out messaging to the community that you don't have any more supplies for them um, so that's kind of that quick run through um, and again just as a reminder uh, if you want uh, or are interested in kind of getting this more in depth um, and having that uh, more full day training, please feel free to contact Emily or myself, um, and we are happy to talk through that, uh, see what the options are, or answer any questions from the presentation today. Thank you. Any questions for this group here? Okay. How about any questions from um, the people attending virtually today? No, I don't see any questions. So okay. That, that training that, that's available, is that in person, online? In person. So it's the same PowerPoint. We just hit half the slides to cut it down to the time here. Um, but uh, in person, we'll do the training. We'll do a little bit of uh, activity associated with it um, and really set up uh, groups to be able to operate a point of distribution on their own. What kind of groups will be training? Uh, communities, schools, agencies? So the question is, what kind of groups are we going to be training? And we're really open to anyone that is feels they have the capacity to do it in the community. Other, I think mostly we've been working with other houses of worship um, as local leaders in their community. Um, but if there was a business that was ready to take this on and would be a good place for it, we'd be happy to help work with them. Um, really, we just want to elevate capacity within our communities. Um, and so anyone that's interested in it should reach out to us and we're happy to have that conversation. Anyone on the chat has any questions? No, I think we're good. Thank you, Daniel Thank and you. Emily for this wonderful presentation. All right. Thank you. And um, you guys uh, attending virtually didn't see this, but that's what this is what makes us strong and great. You should have seen we had um, Salvation Army, FEMA and the state valve figuring this out and they made a, a makeshift solution. They found a, a makeshift solution with the speaker. So we were all able to hear the presentation. Um, Phil, are we good to take um, to turn this off or do we still need it? <laughs> OK, so let me just turn it off and see if we are already. Um, um, Elise, can you speak? Hey, can you hear me? Uh, we still no. have to. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> We'll be fine. <laughs> uh, I'll I'll stand here. I'll talk me. loud. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Let me do your presentation. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Liz. Hey, everybody. Uh, I have to manage her um, PowerPoint, so I'll probably I'll I'll be okay. here. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> okay. Here you go. All right. Ready whenever you on. are. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, hey, everyone. Um, I'm Elise and I'm in Asheville, North Carolina. So um, far, far from you guys, unfortunately, I wish I could be there today. But um, thank you, Luz, for providing this awesome training. I've already learned so much um, today and looking forward to learning more as the day progresses. But um, thank you guys so much for letting me um, speak just for a few minutes on warehouse management. 
I work for Hearts with Hands Disaster Relief, and we are based in Asheville, North Carolina, but we provide donation, we do donation pods, something similar to what we were just hearing about from our friends at Catholic Charities in Daniel. And so during the year, we um, run a warehouse in Asheville prepping for disasters in hurricane season and any type of flooding, tornadoes, anything like that. And we respond in North Carolina, but we also respond outside of the state as well. Um, if you wanna go ahead and go to the next slide, Luz. We'll skip to the next one, probably the one with all the lists. <laughs> So this supply list that you see here is just an example of all of the items that we collect throughout the entire year in our warehouse. We have um, churches, we have um, schools, we have different organizations that take this list from our website and tackle the whole list or just break it down by a certain category and they collect items for us and then bring those items to our warehouse. And so this is kind of our basis of how we have our warehouse set up. Um, we have everything that you see here in a different category in a different section in our warehouse. If you'll go to the next slide. I took this blueprint um, of our warehouse to kind of give you guys an idea. Um, our warehouse that we use is 70,000 square feet. So I know that's a lot more than some and not as much as others. Um, but we try to use every square inch that we have <laughs> to fill it up, um, to prepare supplies and have supplies ready. Um, if you see at the top of the warehouse, um, we have our needs list and bulk items. We're thankful to partner with FEMA and Lutheran Services and some other organizations to provide items um, to other organizations in Western North Carolina and in other parts of the state that may need them. And so we use that whole section to just organize those bulk items that we receive. Um, one of the things that we try to do is um, always have two tractor trailer loads of supplies that are prepared for disaster. So that's what you're gonna see where it says the ready to distribute, oh, <laughs> ready to distribute water, paper products, and the stock items for packing. In that section there, um, and it, also in the volunteer and sorting section where it says ready to distribute hygiene and food, we um, keep all of our pallets, our two tractor trailer loads of items that are ready to go on those racks. So our warehouse has racks and rows. That's what those dotted lines um, represent, all of the racks that we have in our warehouse. And so we're able to go ahead and have our food boxes packed with volunteers. Um, just this past week, we had about 50 volunteers at our warehouse for six hours accumulatively um, that helped us pack hygiene kits and food boxes. And so we have those items that are sitting on the shelf ready to go. And so that way, as soon as we're deployed, we're able to go on a disaster site, set up a point of distribution and get these items um, out to people who have experienced the disaster. Um, if you notice in the warehouse, we also have you know, everything kind of divided up by that list that was beforehand. So from our hygiene, we keep together our food box items, we keep together cleaning products. So we try to keep everything organized by type since we collect such a wide range of items and distribute a wide range of items. If you'll go to the next slide, Blues. Um, the app that we use, I just wanted to kind of share some of our best practices in our warehouse um, at Hearts With Hands. If you're looking for an easy inventory app um, that's really affordable, um, there's even a free version available. It's called Sortly, and there's a desktop um, option and an app option. You'll go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, that slide shows you just kind of the items that you can, um, the different things that it does. There's inventory import, there's, you can take pictures of the items, you have custom folders, there's good reporting on there so we can see exactly how much um, we've added to inventory, how much we've taken away. So it really helps us keep track of things that are coming in and things that are going out for our reporting needs. On the next slide, there's an example this is our box of hope. So this is our individual food box that we give out during a disaster. It has about 25 items inside of it and it's valued at $25 a box. So we're able to see here that we have 15 pallets um, in 
our possession right now that we have created with volunteers. We like to keep at least four um, on hand as a minimum, but we try to always keep those two tractor trailer loads like I mentioned earlier. So it shows us there the value um, of those items. And then we're able to see in the notes section, we have a hundred, um, we put a hundred of those boxes on each pallet. So it's a great way for us to be able to keep up with all of our inventory. Each pallet, once it's wrapped, before it goes on our racks, we're able to print out a QR code label. Um, you can use a label printer or just a regular printer. And we print that out and put it on the pallet on the front. And then I'm able to just scan that QR code um, since I have this app on my phone and it'll pull it up immediately and tell me exactly how many of that item I have. So it comes in handy when we're looking at diapers or the family food items or our even our t-shirts that we have for volunteers. We're able to keep up with all of our inventory with this app. The next example shows us kind of um, all the different categories. So if I'm under the hygiene kit category, I can see how many bags I have made how many cases of actual toothpaste I have, the deodorant. It shows me all the different items that go into our hygiene bags that we make with volunteers. Um, and then the next slide is if you're interested in Sortly, you can just scan this QR code and it'll take you to that um, app and you can kind of look more into it yourself. Um, I know I'm moving kind of quickly, trying to keep us on track, but does anyone have any questions so far about the items that we collect or our warehouse layout or the app sortly before I move on to the next section. <laughs> Anyone has any questions here? No, not yet. No, you're, you're can't good. see the I chat, can... um, Elise, so I don't know if there's any questions in the chat uh, box. I'll, I'll keep an eye on that. I don't see okay. <laughs> Thank Wonderful. you so much. Um, one of the things I did just want to mention too is um, <clears throat> With um, our warehouse, some of the things that I've already heard mentioned, we always want to, we keep a way of everything that comes in. So we weigh every donation that comes in our warehouse before it gets put into the sorting section. Um, so kind of take you through our process. An item comes in, it's been donated, and then we're taking it to be weighed. And then once it's been weighed, it goes to the sorting section and I'm able to separate it if it's a hygiene item, a food item, clothing we don't typically take clothing but we still get it um you know if it's a cleaning product we're able to divide it out so that way when our volunteers come to put the kits together um we're able to have all of that already separated and organized so it works out really well um and then that way once the trailer's leaving we weigh the pallets and we know exactly how many pounds we were able to ship and um, for each disaster and for the whole year so we'll go ahead and move to the needs list section. So one of the cool things that um, we've really enjoyed being able to have a part in is learning and utilizing needs list. So needs list is a platform. If you're not familiar with it, it's already been mentioned a couple of times today, but in partnership with volunteer NC and um, NC VOAD, we have access as an organization to needs list. And we're able to post needs that we have and we're able to post things that we have in bulk that other organizations could use. There's also opportunities to post the need for volunteers or to offer um, food box or if you are a service like you could cut down trees or anything like that. You have an opportunity to post that as well. So it's supplies and for services, which is really nice. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, Luz. Um, this is, I have some QR codes throughout, so if you aren't familiar with needs list, you can just scan the QR code. Hopefully it works in person from your seat. <laughs> if not, I'll be sharing these links um, with Luz for her to send out in the notes as well. Um, but you can see here in there, this is a screenshot from the platform itself, but you can see that there's needs posted for paper bowls, um, razors, deodorant, those are all posted by us. Um, right now we put paper bowls in every single one of our food boxes. We put two of them in there. So that way, whenever they open up that pull tab can of chicken noodle soup, they're able to pour in their bowl and it has cutlery in the box and everything for them. So paper bowls are a need for us. We are currently out of them. 
um, razors for shaving. It seems like I can never get enough razors for um, our hygiene kits. We seem to run out of those pretty quickly. So I have those posted. So I was able to go on there um, and you can see where it says Hearts with Hands posted those and put a quantity down. And then there are other organizations and people like you who could be on the platform to see those needs and be able to possibly meet those needs. And then we can coordinate pickup or delivery and so forth and so on. If you go to the next slide, Luz, it shows right now all of the offers that are posted um, on Needs List. So you can see the services, you can see the supplies um, that are posted on there, soap dispensers. So if you see anything on this list that you or your organization or business you know, could use for disaster purposes, you can go on Needs List and then claim these items and then we'll be able to coordinate getting those delivered to you or pick them up. Um, so that's one of the things that we love about needs list is just how you can see what's available. And there's several organizations, even in the last couple of weeks with the blue skies that we've been able to coordinate and distribute items to them. And they've been able to use it serving in shelters and food pantries. And it's become just an incredible resource for us to be able to get supplies that we need and be able to share excess items that we've been given that we want to share with our partners. The next slide shows um, some of the needs that we have. There's tarps on there, there's construction bags, shampoos, more hygiene items. So these are all the current needs that are posted. So one of my things that I want to put out to you guys today is I know there's a lot more needs out there and offers that we can all be um, accessing needs list and using it and um, using it to its full potential. So if you go to the next slide, you can get the link there. This takes us to the volunteer NC training on needs list. I know I've gone kind of quickly as an overview, but this is a very detailed training um, that we were able to have um, in partnership with the company Needsless itself. And they did a video with Luz to show us all the details of how to get signed up on Needsless, how to use it, how to post needs and offers, how to claim offers. It's all real time, which is what I love. So I can post something, someone claims it, and I'm able to mark when it's been um, completed, when they've received it. Um, it's great for my tracking for inventory purposes. It keeps up with reporting for me. Um, I'm able to access how much I've posted versus how much people have claimed. So it's a great free tool for all of us to be using. And um, I hope that you'll take advantage of it. The next slide um, shows you to the user guide. There's a user guide on the actual website itself that um, goes just step by step if you prefer to go that way and um, read for it yourself. I know that there's lots of different types of learners out there. So there's the video kind and a reading kind. <laughs> um, the next slide shows you the registration link. So if you've not already signed up for a needs list account, um, it's super easy to do. Um, if you'll just scan the QR code, again, we'll send out the exact link in the chat. I'll try to post that as soon as I get done presenting. But the needs list link will take you, that QR code will take you exactly to where you need to go on the page to be able to set up your account as a new user and go ahead and start keeping an eye on the items that are being posted and the needs that are being posted to see what you um, and your organization could help with. I know that we've talked about needs list kind of a lot today. I'm excited to see, you know, Persia made me super excited when she mentioned us all being able to partner together, hopefully more. And I think um, that'll be great. The more we can all collaborate our resources together, the better. <laughs> and we have things in our warehouse that I know other organizations need. And so that's why we use needs list. So that way we're able to share it and um, let people let people know about it. Any questions on needs list? Not in the There's room. <laughs> There's some questions in the chat, so I'm going to answer those real quick. It says, which area of North Carolina do you serve and do you only work during disasters or you can fill needs now too? And we will respond anywhere in North Carolina. We go all the way to the eastern side of the state when there's a disaster. And then we've responded to disasters in Western North Carolina as well. Um, and we respond and help 
during the disaster immediately, but we can partner with long-term recovery groups or other organizations that are doing long-term recovery work even now. So if there's a need that you feel like Hearts of Hand specifically could help meet, um, definitely reach out to me. My contact information will be on the last slide again, and then I'll also um, share it in the chat with you. But yeah, we would love to partner together and learn more about what needs you have. I was going to mention to um, Greg, our director, he is over the um, donations committee for volunteer um, BOAD. And so I wanted to share just a little bit about that is, on behalf of him. But we do have a warehouse in Goldsboro that is lined up if needed during a disaster. We're able to use that warehouse for the eastern side of the state to go ahead and bring items um, that, and sort through items and all types of things that are needed during a disaster. So that is one thing that we have kind of on the back burner if needed for a North Carolina hurricane, which we pray we don't need. <laughs> But it is there. It is there. Um, so if you're interested, we have a meeting about donations where we're going to talk more about needs list, how we can get it into the communities, how we can share it with people who don't know about it, um, churches, other organizations, locals on the ground. And that meeting is going to take place on Thursday, July 27th at 10 a.m. So if you would like the Zoom link information, um, I will share that with the chat as well. But you can click or um, scan the QR code there for that meeting info. And if you're not a member of any North Carolina VOAD committee, I encourage you to you know, scan that QR code and see what committees are there. There's volunteer committees. There is committees for donations management. There's board committees. There's um, DEI committees. There's child well-being, child well-being committees. There's all types of committees, case management. And we need people like you who are passionate about disasters um, who would be willing to to join this committee. So I everyone has a lot on their plate, I know. But if you have time for one more thing, um, definitely scan that QR code and go ahead and sign up for another committee. Um, the next slide is just my information. Again, if you um, scan that QR code, it'll take you to my contact card and you're able to reach out to us about any questions you may have. But um, I just wanted to share a couple things, you know, about warehouse is label everything. Don't put anything on a shelf or a pallet <laughs> that isn't labeled. Once you have that pallet wrapped, put a label of some sort on it. So that way you know what it is without having to get that pallet back down. Um, that's one of the things that I love about Sortly is it helps us with our labeling. Um, but you're able to go ahead and, you know, see what's in that palette, know what's in that palette, have it in an organized place. Um, being organized is key to response. I feel like we're able to have those supplies ready to go and um, respond quickly to a disaster because we have everything in its place and we know exactly where it's at. <laughs> and we're able to just quickly um, pull it down and get it on a tractor trailer and get it to the disaster site. So that's just one of my little tidbits is just um, if you have questions about Sortly or needs list or running a warehouse, you know, please let us know. But um, this is just some of the best practices as our organization uses. We take advantage of the needs list, the volunteer NC, NC VOAD. We're constantly, you know, being a part of the meetings and trying to collaborate with other organizations um, to be able to learn best practices. Like this meeting today has already been so helpful and um, I've learned so much. So I'm just grateful to have had the opportunity to share with you um, about these things. If anyone has any questions, that's pretty much all I got. <laughs> questions from the audience here? We have one question. Teresa? Yes. Is this resource just just available to other nonprofits or is this something that the local county EMs can reach out for um, So that question was about needs list. Is that correct? Yes. Um, whether the resource is available only for local nonprofit organizations or uh, county local governments will be able to have access. Um, you can you can either answer that question or I can answer it. Doesn't matter. If you want to go ahead. Yeah. If, since you're there in person, it might be easier for you to. 
So initially, the platform was developed to support the nonprofit and faith-based organizations working on the ground because, you know, at the state level and local emergency management level, you have WebBOC to communicate for donations and all, all, all of the other needs that the county encounter. Um, so for that reason, we partner with NeedsList to support the nonprofits and faith-based organization. But uh, at this moment, it is only available for those um, type of organizations. However, there has been conversations um, that we have been having about the need of maybe adding more groups um, to be able to have access to the platform. Um, that could probably come in the near future, but at, at this moment, just faith-based and nonprofit organizations will be able to coordinate through needs this. Yes. Is that correct, like Alice? Ask. I will, yes, I was just going to say, um, Greg, our director, he's got some great relationships with some emergency management officers and um, employees, and he would be happy to, you know, coordinate with you. So if you know of needs or um, resources, you know, you could work in partnership with Hearts With Hands to have those um, resources posted or to find out what people are needing or things like that. He would be happy to coordinate with you on that or myself even. Yeah, and uh, I am one of uh, the main administrator of the platform um, for um, volunteering. C. So as well, you, I can be your point of contact for any needs and we can definitely post them. But like I said, um, we have been having conversations about opening um, the platform to more organizations, but it's probably it's gonna happen in the, in the future. I mean, I, I I can see this more in the recovery phase. Yes, absolutely. And the platform is active now. We haven't had a whole lot of activity of exchange of donations and vol or volunteer. Um, so for this reason, what we're doing at this moment is just um, trying to do outreach and, and try to increase knowledge among the community that the platform is available so that way we're not registering their inactive disaster um and again we have hold a couple of trainings one happened the beginning of this year and and the training is recorded so it's available at any time so we're trying to make sure that people know how to use it and that they know it's available for donations and volunteer management any other questions related to um, warehousing or needs lease or the platforms that um, Alice mentioned? No, not uh, not um, in person. How about virtually, Elise? No, nope, we're good on there too. So I think that might be all. <laughs> I appreciate okay. it. I appreciate the time to share. And if anyone has any questions, um, I'm going to get all the links and stuff posted in the chat here so that Luz will have it for the minute. So thank you so much. Yes, and all of that information that is being posted on the chat, I am going to download it and provide it to all of you who attended in person as well. Uh, well, thank you. And Elise gave us, um, let's see. We are to um, be back at 120, I believe. I don't have the agenda in front of me. If somebody can yes, help um, me. Oh, yeah, 120. Time. Yeah, yes, it was yes. from 1220 to 120 as lunch. So right on, right on track. <laughs> right on track. So thank you, everyone. Um, for those who are attending virtually, we are going to pause it and we will be back at 120. Thank you. Thank you, Luz. All right, so you are all dismissed.
uh, to uh, where's that? Turn uh, left on the Reed Creek Road. That will put you up at the stoplight with uh, Edwards Mill Road. If you turn right uh, there on the left-hand corner in the shopping center, are several places, including what a lot of people think is the greatest hamburger in the world, which is Char Grill. And then right across the street from that is the Firehouse Subs, and that's the, the closest that we have. And you can always Google the best help. So we'll meet again at 120. Okay. Okay. So Phil was saying that the IT guy told him that no, maybe this is it here, that it should be automatically tied into the sound. So let's see if that just works. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah.